Chapter One of the Emperor's Candlesticks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kevin Green. The Emperor's Candlesticks by Baroness Emma Auxey. Chapter One. Gay, chic Vienna was on fate. What would you? Shrove Tuesday is the very last day allowed by our Holy Mother the Church for revelry before the long austere forty days of Lent, and if we do not make use of her full permission to enjoy ourselves to the full extent of our capacity, we shall have nothing left to atone for to-morrow when the good fathers place the cross of ashes on our foreheads and bid us remember that dust we are to dust return. Therefore Vienna was drinking the overflowing cup of pleasure to-day, had been drinking in it in its gaily lighted streets and boulevards, and was now enjoying its last drops at the Opera Ball, the climax to a carnival that had been unusually brilliant this year. And in the hall, where but two nights ago the harmonious discords of Wagner's Nibelungen had enchanted and puzzled a seriously minded audience, to-night Piero and Pierrette, Fausts and Marguerites, nymphs, fairies, gnomes, and what-nots, chased each other with merry cries and loud laughter, to the sweet tunes of Strauss's melodious dreamy waltzes, while the boxes, each filled with spectators eager to watch, though afraid to mingle with the giddy throng, showed mysterious dominoes and black masks, behind which gleamed eyes rendered bright with suppressed excitement at the intoxicating spectacle below. "'Come down, fair domino, I know thee,' whispered a richly dressed odalisque whose jewelled mask could not outshine the merry twinkle of her black eyes beneath. She had placed one dainty hand on the ledge of a pit tear box in which two black dominoes had sat for some time, partially hidden by the half-drawn curtains, and had watched the gay throng beneath them for some half-hour or so, apparently unnoticed. The taller of the two dominoes bent forward, trying to pierce the enterprising Uri's disguise. "'Nay, if you know me, fair mask, come up to me.' and let me renew an acquaintance that should have never been dropped. But she had once more disappeared as swiftly as she had come, and the black domino, whose curiosity was aroused, tried vainly to distinguish her graceful figure among the glitter of the moving crowd. "'I wonder how sober dresses succeeded in drawing that gay butterfly's attention,' he said, turning to his companion, "'and what her object was in speaking to me, if she did not mean to continue the causerie.' "'Oh, it is the usual way with these gay Viennese bourgeoisies,' replied his companion. "'Your Imperial Highness has been sitting too much in the shade of that curtain, and the odalisk thought your obvious desire to remain hidden an object of interest.' The taller domino now leant forward in the box, his opera-glass glued to his mask, eagerly scanning the crowd, but, though numerous Moorish and Turkish veiled figures passed backwards and forwards, he did not recognise the enterprising odalisk among them. "'Look not for the good that lies far away, when the best is so close at hand,' whispered a mocking voice close to his elbow. The black domino turned sharply round, just in time to catch hold of a little hand, which had crept around the column that separated the box in which he was sitting from the adjoining one. "'The best is still too far,' he whispered. "'Is it unattainable?' "'Always try to obtain the best,' replied the mocking voice, "'even at the risk of scaling the inaccessible walls of an opera-box.' I cannot get to the fair mask without momentarily letting go this tiny hand, and it is never safe to let a bird, even for a moment, out of its cage. Black Domino, we must often risk the lesser to obtain the great, said the odalisk maliciously. I entreat your Imperial Highness to remain here, said the second Domino imploringly. You are here incognito. I am the only one in attendance on your Highness, and— "'All the more reason why it should be possible for one brief moment, "'for a Svaric to do as he likes,' retorted the taller domino laughingly. "'And before his companion had time to add another word of warning, "'the young man had, with the freedom which King Carnival always allows at such a time and in such places, "'climbed the ledge of the box, and scrambled with youthful alacrity into the one "'that contained his mysterious bright-eyed Uri. "'But alas, for the waywardness and fickleness of the Daughters of the East,' No sooner had the black domino safely reached terra firma once more, after his perilous climb, than the swift opening and shutting of a door told him, but too plain, that the will-o'-the-wisp wished to evade him yet again. What young man is there, be him prince or peasant, who would have allowed so mocking a game to be carried on at his expense? 
Nicholas Alexandrovitch, son and heir to the Tsar of all Russias, remembered only that he was twenty years of age, that he had come to the opera ball, accompanied by that dry old stick, Lavrovsky, with the sole purpose of enjoying himself incognito for once, and he started off in hot pursuit. The passage behind the box was quite empty, but in the direction leading to the foyer some fifty yards distant, he distantly caught the sight of a swiftly disappearing figure, and the heels of the prettiest pair of Turkish slippers it had ever been his good fortune to see. The foyer was, at that late hour of the night, a scene of the motley, most picturesque confusion. Assyrian queens were walking arm in arm with John Bulls, Marguerites were coquetting unblushingly with gallants of some two centuries later, while Hamlets and Othellos were indulging in the favourite Viennese pastime of hoisting their present partners onto the tallest pillars they could find, with a view to starving them out up there into a jump some ten or twelve feet below, when they would perforce land into the outstretched arms of their delighted swains. And very pretty these tall pillars looked, thus decorated with living, laughing, chatting figures of Vivandière, Pierrette, Sai, and of sober Ophelias and languishing Isolds. But the black domino heeded that not, darting hither and thither, taking no notice of cheeky sallies and rough bousculade, he pushed his way through the crowd towards one spot, close to the entrance, where a special little jewelled cap was fast disappearing through the wide-open portals that led into the gaily lighted place beyond. The Odalesque had evidently either repented of her audacious adventure, or was possessed of an exceptionally bold spirit, for without a moment's hesitation she ran down the stone steps, taking no further heed of the jesting crowd she was forced to pass through or of the two or three idle masks, who accosted her, and also started in pursuit. Having reached the bottom of the steps, she seemed to hesitate a moment, only a second, perhaps. Was it intentional? But that second gave Nicholas Alexandrovitch the chance he had for some time striven for. He overtook her just as she laid her hand on the door of a faker, which was drawn up, and lifted her off the ground as if she were a feather. He placed her inside, and sat down in front of her, hot and panting, while the coachman, without apparently waiting for any directions, drove off rapidly through the ever noisier and gayer crowd. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. All this had excited little or no attention among the bystanders, how should it? An opera ball teems with such episodes. Two young people, one in pursuit of the other, a signal, a handy faker, et voilà, who cares? Everybody is busy with his own affairs, his own little bits of adventure and intrigue. Surely that grey domino over there, standing under one of the fine electric light chandeliers, could have no interest in the unknown odalisque and her ardent swain, for he made not the slightest attempt at pursuit. Yet his eyes followed the fast-disappearing faker, as long as it was recognisable amidst the crowds of vehicles and mummers. A young man he was, evidently not anxious to remain incognito, for he had thrown back the hood of his domino, and held the mask in his hand. Yet though he thus, as it were, courted recognition, he visibly started as a soft musical voice, with the faintest vestige of foreign intonation, addressed him merrily. "'Why so moody, Monsieur Volensky?' Have Strauss's waltzes tired out your spirits, or has your donna eloped with a hated rival?" The young man pulled himself together, and forced open his eyes and thoughts to wander away from the faker, which now appeared as a mere speck, to the graceful figure in front of him, who owned that musical voice, and had called him by name. "'Madame Demidoff,' he said, evidently not pleasantly surprised. "'Herself,' she replied laughingly, "'do not assume an astonishment so badly justified. I am not a Viennese grand dame, and coming to an opera ball is not the most unpardonable of my eccentricities. Yes, but alone? Not alone, she rejoined, still merry, since you are here to protect me from my worst perils, and lend me a helping hand in the most dire difficulties. Allow me to start on these most enviable functions by finding your carriage for you, he said a trifle absently. She bit her lip and tried a laugh but this time there was a soupçon of harshness in the soft foreign notes. "'Ah, Ivan, how you must reckon on my indulgence that you venture so unguardedly on so ungallant a speech!' "'Was it ungallant?' "'Come, 
"'What would your judgment be on a young man, one of our jeunesse dorée, who, meeting a lady at the opera ball, offers after the first two minutes to find her carriage for her?' "'I should deem it to be an unpardonable sin, and punishable by some nameless tortures, if that lady happens to be Madame Demidoff.' he said, striving to make banal speeches to hide his evident desire for immediate retreat. She looked at him keenly for a minute, then sighed a quick, impatient little sigh. "'Well, call my carriage, Ivan. I will not keep you. You obviously have some pressing engagement.' "'The Cardinal,' he began clumsily. "'Ah, His Eminence requires your attention at so late an hour,' she said, still a little bitterly. His Eminence is leaving Vienna tomorrow, and there are still many letters to answer. I shall probably be writing most of the night through. She appeared content with this explanation, and while Valensky gave directions to one of the gorgeous attendants, stationed outside the house, to call Madame Demidoff's carriage, she resumed the conversation in a more matter-of-fact tone. His Eminence will be glad of a holiday after the trying diplomatic business of the past few weeks, and you, Monsieur Valensky, I feel sure have also earned a few days' repose. The Cardinal certainly has given me two or three weeks' respite, while he himself goes to Tyrol for the benefit of his health. And after that? We meet at Petersburg, where His Eminence has an important memorial to submit to His Majesty the Tsar. You yourself, madame? Yes, I shall probably be there before you both arrive, and thus have the honour of welcoming His Eminence in person. But— here is my carriage. It is au revoir, then, Monsieur Volensky, not adieu. Luckily for you, she added, once more coquettishly, for had it been a longer parting, I should have found it hard to forgive your not even calling to leave a bit of pasteboard with my concierge. He had given her his arm, and was leading her down the wide stone stairs, trying all the while not to appear relieved that the interview was at last over, and his faro companion on the way to leaving him alone with his anxieties and agitation. "'Good night, Ivan,' she said, after he had helped her into her carriage, and wrapped her furs around her. Long after her coachman had started, she leant her head out of the window and watched him, as long as she could distinguish his grey domino among the crowd. There was a wistful look on her face, also a frown, perhaps of self-contempt. Then, when the carriage had left the opera-house, with all its gaiety and tumult behind, and she no longer could see Ivan Volensky's figure at the foot of the wide stone stairs, she seemed to dismiss with an impatient sigh and a shrug any little touch of sentiment that may have lurked in her thoughts, and it was an impassive, slightly irritable grand dame who alighted out of the little elegant coupé under the portico of one of the finest houses on the Colovatring. "'Send Eugène to me in my boudoir at once,' she said to the footman, who preceded her upstairs. "'If he is from home, one of you sit up till he comes in. If he is asleep, he must be wakened forthwith.' She seemed too agitated to sit down, though the armchairs in her luxurious boudoir stood most invitingly by. She was pacing up and down the room, listening for every footstep. Far from her was all touch of sentiment, all recollection of the figure in the grey domino whom she had called Ivan, and who seemed all but too eager to be rid of her. What she had seen to-night, not half hour ago, had mystified her beyond expression. She and of this she felt convinced, was the only person, with the exception of old Count Lavrovsky, and the one confidential valet, who in this city knew that, in the guise of that black domino, was the heir to the Russian throne. He had been spoken to by a forward mask, disguised as an odalesque. That was neither surprising nor unusual at carnival time, when every description of forwardness is not only permissible but encouraged. The Tsarevich, with useful impetuosity, had followed, forgetting his rank and the dangers that always surround his position, and both he and the Odalesque had disappeared into a fakia, which Madame Demidoff felt convinced had been there ready waiting for them, and driven off without apparently any directions being given to the coachman. "'Come in,' she said, much relieved, as a discreet footstep and a rap at the door caught her ear, still on the alert. She took up a cigarette from a little case that lay close to her hand, she felt it would calm her nerves, and steady her voice. A man entered, flat-nosed, high-cheeked, boned Russian of the lower classes, whose low forehead betokened an absence of what is usually called intellectuality, but whose piercing, cold grey eyes, deeply sunk between the thinnest of lids, spoke of cunning and a clarity. A useful man, no doubt. Madame Demidoff seemed more calm the moment she spoke to him. "'Eugène,' she said, 
Listen to me, for something very mysterious has happened at the Opera Ball to-night, and there is some work you must do for me now, at once, and also during the course of to-morrow. The Tsarevich went to the Opera Ball to-night, disguised as a black domino. Yes, he was in Vienna, incognito. No one knew it. The whole thing was foolish in the extreme, and I am beginning to fear some foul agency must have been at work. He was decoyed from his opera box by a woman dressed as an odalisk, in red and gold, I think. No matter the description. There were hundreds in that guise at the opera. Nicholas Alexandrovitch followed her. A faker was waiting for them. He jumped in, and it drove off at great rapidity towards the old town. Yes, Barina for she had paused a moment to collect her thoughts before giving him her final instructions. "'You must find out for me first whether the Tsarevich has returned to his hotel, and if not, what steps Count Lavrovsky is taken to discover the key to the mystery. You must dog the old man's every footstep, and if he goes to the police, or sends any telegraphic message across to Petersburg, you must apprise me of it at once. Moreover, both outside the Opera House, at the Faker stations, and at the various railways you must glean what scraps of information you can relating to the flying odalisk and domino, or the faker that drove them. I leave by the express for Petersburg to-morrow at midnight. You must come and tell me what you have learnt in the early part of the evening. She dismissed him now, and when once more alone she sat and thought over the occurrences of to-night. Then it was that, and anon, the wistful look, almost of yearning, that rendered her aristocratic face so sweet and tender, crept into her eyes, but when it came, the impatient little sigh and self-contemptuous frown invariably accompanied it. Surely this worldly woman, this elegant grand dame, would not allow even the faintest vestige of sentiment to creep up among her recollections of the gay carnival ball, more especially as that sentiment was evidently directed towards one who— "'Ah, me!' Madame Demidoff sighed again, threw away a cigarette, and rang for her maid, all with the idea of putting an end— to any more thinking that night. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. As soon as Ivan Volensky lost sight completely of Madame Demidoff's carriage, he, with a sigh of relief, retraced his steps up the wide stairs of the Opera House, and joined a couple of dominoes, who, dressed like himself in uniform grey, stood isolated among the group of masks that encumbered the entrance to the foyer. Together all three began sauntering in the direction of the Kolovatrink. They walked on in silence for some time, smoking cigarettes and pushing their way through the crowd as best they could. On the Ringstrasse the scene was as gay as ever, laughing groups of masks in bands of a score or so, occupying the whole width of the street, made progress somewhat difficult, but the three grey dominoes seemed in no great hurry. They exchanged jests, where repartee was expected of them, and mixed with the crowd, where it was impossible to avoid it. The sumptuous houses and gorgeously decorated shops on either side were illuminated with many-coloured lights, changing this midnight hour into light as broad as day. On the balconies, gaily festooned with flowers, groups of onlookers gazed on the animated scene below, whilst every now and then, from some opened windows, dreamy waltzes and weird Xardas, mingled with the noisy street cries and laughter, telling of aristocratic balls and parties, where the King Carnival was courted with equal mirth, if somewhat less exuberance and noise. Sometimes the groups of mummers would stop beneath some of these windows and watch the bejewelled figures flitting to and fro, and listen to the soft cadences of the gypsy music, the one thing Hungarian the Viennese cannot bring themselves to despise. But the three dominoes did not pause long amidst this grey and bustling scene, nor did the brilliant lighted ring appear to have any attraction for them, for presently they turned into a side street, uninviting and dark though it seemed, and being free to walk more rapidly soon left the sounds of merry laughter and revelry far behind them. Still they walked on in silence, not heeding now the few muffled masks that passed them with a laugh and jest on their way towards the gayer part of the city. With these few exceptions the streets they now crossed were completely deserted, no illuminations from the windows proclaimed the reign of King Carnival. No sound of dreamy waltz music lent a touch of merriment to the dismal, stone-paved courtyards that yawned drearily on either side. Into one of these the three dominoes presently turned, 
and, without waiting to reply to the concierge's challenge as to whom they were seeking at so late an hour, they found their way to the back stone staircase, which was but dimly lighted by a hanging lamp that flickered in the draught, and threw weird shadows on the steps. Having reached the second flight, one of the dominoes gave a peculiar rhythmic knock on one of the doors facing him, which, after a few moments, was thrown open, while the anxious voice asked, "'Is that you, Balakin?' "'Yes,' replied the domino, "'with Ivan and Sergei. Let us in.' The room which they had now entered, furnished with an attempt at comfort, half as an office and half as a smoking lounge, was filled with some twelve or fourteen men of all ages, and, apparently, judging from their clothes, of very mixed social positions, while four or five of them, collarless and probably shirtless, wore working jackets and clumsy boots, some wore beautifully cut dress-clothes and spotless linen, with a flower in the buttonhole, and one elderly man, with a pointed grey beard and handsome aristocratic features, wore two or three decorations fastened to his coat. All, however, whether peer or peasant, seemed on the best of terms, together, and smoking pipes and cigarettes of peace and fraternity. "'What news?' asked half a dozen voices, as the new arrivals divested themselves of their grey dominoes, and shook hands with those sitting around. "'The best.' "'Where is he?' asked a voice. "'In Merkovich's faker, with Maria Stefanovna. "'And presently?' "'Merkovich's guest, at number twenty-one, Hoymarkt.' The questions and answers followed each other in rapid succession. The tension of suspense had evidently been great, the relief at the news most obviously welcome, for a sigh of satisfaction seemed to rise in unison from a dozen heaving oppressed chests. "'And Merkovich? asked one of the older men. "'He will be here anon.' "'As soon as he is safe under lock and key.' "'Then he is in our power?' "'Absolutely. Did Lavrovsky attempt to follow him?' "'Not till it was too late, and the faker was out of sight. He fell into the trap without a shadow of suspicion.' There was a pause now. Evidently much had to be thought of, and serious points considered, for during the next ten minutes not a sound disturbed the stillness of the room save the crackling of burning logs in the wide chimney, and one or two whispered questions and rapidly given answers. Then a heavy tread was heard in the passage outside, the same rhythmical knock on the door, while a gruff voice said, Murkovich. A Herculean man, some six foot three in height, with long grey hair thrown back from a massive forehead, and piercing grey eyes, half hidden under a pair of bushy eyebrows, now joined the group of smokers, greeting them all, but with two words. All safe. Prisoner? Safely in my house. No windows. Only a skylight. No chance of discovery, unless of escape. And Maria Stefanovna? Did her part splendidly. He suspected nothing till he heard the door locked behind him. Did he speak? Only to call himself a fool, which remark was obvious. He asked no questions? None. The deaf-mute valet was there to receive him? Yes, and waited on him, while he took some of the supper we had prepared for him. What about Lavrovsky? asked a voice from the further end of the room. He went back to his box, and is waiting there now, I should imagine. In the meanwhile, Merkovich, you have promised us the best treatment for our prisoner? Yes, said Merkovich grimly. I hate him, but I will treat him well. The deaf-mute is a skilled valet. The rooms are comfortable. The bed is luxurious. The food will be choice and plentiful. Very different, he added sullenly, from what Denajewski and the others are enduring at this moment. They are practically free now, said a young voice enthusiastically. We can demand their liberty. Let them refuse if they dare. Yes, added Merkovich with a smile. It would go hard with Nicholas Alexandrovitch now, if they refused to let our comrades go. "'To business, friends, there is no time for talk,' said the authoritative voice of the elderly man who wore the decoration. The cigarettes and pipes were with one accord put aside, and all chairs turned towards the table, placed in the centre of the room, on which stood a tempered with a green shade, and scattered all about loose bundles of paper, covered with writings and signatures. "'There are many points to decide,' resumed he, who appeared to be the leader amongst them. The deed, accomplished tonight thanks to those heads who planned, and those arms who executed it, great as it is, has still a greater object in view. This, we over here cannot attain. The turn of Taranyev and the brothers in Petersburg has now come, to do their share of the work. The chairman paused, all heads nodded in acquiescence. Then he resumed. We have been obliged to act very hurriedly, and on our own initiative. Taranyev and the others, so far, know absolutely nothing. 
"'They must hear of it at once,' said one voice. "'And cease any plotting of their own,' assented another. "'It could only now lead to certain disaster.' agreed the chairman, if they were in any sort of way to draw the attention of the third section on themselves. "'Or us,' grimly added Merkovich. "'Obviously, therefore, our messenger's duty to them will be twofold,' said the President. "'The bringing of great news, as it now stands, and our instructions as to the next course, they must follow to attain the noble object we all have in view.' "'Yes, the letter to Alexander the Third, said a young voice eagerly. This was the important point. More eagerness in the listeners, more enthusiasm among the younger men was, if possible, discernible. "'I have here,' said the President, taking a document from the table, "'with the help of the committee, embodied our idea as to how that letter should be framed. "'It will be an appetizing breakfast relish for the autocrat of all the Russians, "'when he finds it, as he does all our written warnings, "'underneath his cup of morning coffee.' sneered Merkovich, who had been sitting all this while smoking grimly, and muttering at intervals short sentences between his teeth, which boded no good to the prisoner he had under his charge. "'Our letter,' said the President, "'this time will contain the information that the Tsarevich is at the present moment in the hands of some persons unknown, and those persons will continue to hold him a hostage till certain conditions are complied with.' "'Those conditions being?' queried one of the bystanders. Complete pardon for Dunajewski, and all those who are in prison with him in connection with that last plot, together with a free pass out of the country. Nicholas Alexandrovitch to be set free the day they have crossed the frontier, added a member of the committee. If in answer to this he simply sets the third section on our track, queried a voice diffidently. The message shall also contain a warning, said Merkovich grimly that in the case the police are mixed up in the matter, they would not even find a dead body. A pause followed this ominous speech. This was the dark side of this daring plot, the possible murder of a helpless prisoner. Yet they all knew it might become inevitable. The hostage's life might have to be weighed against theirs in case of discovery, and, instead of barter, there might be need for revenge. "'They will never dare refuse,' said the President, endeavouring to dispel the gloom cast over most of these young people by the suggestion of a cold-blooded murder. There will be no need for measures so unworthy of us. They know completely the Tsarevich's life is in our hands, said Merkovich authoritatively. They cannot defy us. They are bound to treat and bargain with us. We might demand the freedom of every convict now languishing in Siberia, and they would have to remember that the heir of all the Russias sleeps with a dagger held over his heart, and be bound to grant what we ask. "'But let them be just and merciful, and we will be so likewise,' added the President's more gentle voice. "'Let Dunajewski and all those concerned cross the frontier with a free pass, and that day the Tsarevich will be restored to liberty. But let Alexander understand that at the slightest suspicion of police intervention the life of the hostage will from that hour be considered forfeit. There was no reply to this. The President had been putting into words the decision of all those assembled. Merkovich sat still, his powerful fist clutched on the table, his eyes a dark, lurid fire that told of dangerous thoughts. "'There is one person whom I think the Committee have omitted to consider,' said a voice at last, breaking the silence that had lasted some minutes, "'and that is Lavrovsky.' "'Pardon me,' said the President. "'We have, I think, all thought of that incompetent, though at the present moment important personage, and all reflected as to what his possible attitude would be throughout.' "'I have not the slightest doubt,' said a voice from the further end of the table, "'that it will take Lavrovsky some days before he will make up his mind to communicate with his own government.' "'Yes,' assented another. "'I have met him in Petersburg once or twice, and he has always given me the idea of being a weak and irresolute man.' whose first feeling when he realises, and it will take him some days to do that, that the Tsarevich has effectually disappeared, will be one of intense terror, lest the blame for the disappearance be primarily laid on him, and he be dispatched to Siberia to expiate his negligence. And the fool puts up with being treated, a mere valet to a dynasty who would treat him with such baseness, and serving a government which, at the first opportunity, would turn on him and whip him like a cur muttered Merkovich wrathfully. 
"'We have, therefore, every chance that, in our favour, resumed the President, "'that Lavrovsky will not communicate with Petersburg at any rate for the first few days, "'whilst he will be busying himself in trying to obtain some clue or idea as to his charge's whereabouts. "'He may probably,' suggested someone, "'employ some private detective in this city, and until that hope has failed him, "'endeavour to keep the Tsarevich's disappearance a secret from the Russian government.' "'Be that as it may,' concluded the President, "'I think we may safely presume that our messenger will get a few days' start on that slowly moving courtier, and that three days is all he will need to seek out Taranyev, who will lose no time in seeing that the letter reaches its proper destination.' "'You are, of course, presuming all the time,' now said a voice, an elderly man's voice, sober and sedate, "'that Lavrovsky, thinking only of his own safety, will at first merely endeavour to keep the matter of the disappearance of his charge as much of a secret as possible. Those of our friends who know him best seem, by judging his pretty well-known dilatoriness, to have arrived at this conclusion, which no doubt is the right one. But we must all remember that there is one other person, shall I say, enemy, whom Lavrovsky may, in spite of his fears, choose for a confidant, and that person is neither dilatory nor timorous, and has, moreover, an army of allies of every rank in Vienna to help him speedily and secretly. You all know who I mean. The question was not answered. What need was there of it? They all knew her by reputation. The beautiful Madame Demidoff. And all suspected and feared her. Yet who dared to say she was a spy or worse, this grand dame who was one of the ornaments of Viennese society? "'I spoke to her at the opera ball to-night,' said Ivan Volensky, who up to this point had taken very little part in the discussion. "'She was there, then?' queried an anxious voice. "'She is everywhere. There is a brilliant function,' replied Ivan. "'And it is just possible that she may have instructions to keep her dainty ears open. Whenever she came across any of her compatriots, when I met her, it was just after Maria Stefanova had driven off in the faker. Madame Demidoff was wanting her carriage, and asked me to help her in finding it. "'No doubt she is our greatest danger,' said the President. "'For if anything did rouse her suspicions to-night, she certainly would not hesitate to employ a whole army of private and police detectives, and may force our hand before our brothers in Petersburg have time to play the trump card.' "'After all,' said Merkevich, if we find that she is exerting her powers too much, it is always within our means to give her a warning that the Tsarevich's life is in actual danger through her interference. Anyhow, my friends, now concluded the President, it is well that, knowing our foes, we keep a strict watch on them. After all, let us always remember that, though we risk our lives and liberties, they, in their turn, must first see that the Tsarevich is quite safe. We hold the most precious of hostages. For once we are absolute masters of the situation. I don't think we gain anything by discussing any further what Lavrovsky and Madame Demidoff may or may not do. They must be strictly watched, that is evident. But the message to Taranyev is the most important. We can include as many conditions in our letter as we like, and leave them at Petersburg to do the rest. Yes, the message, the papers, was the unanimous assent to the President's last decision. He took up the papers one by one that were lying on the table, and divided them into two bundles. "'These,' he said, handing one of the packets to his neighbour, "'are not of much value, and in view of the approaching crisis, in my opinion, had better be destroyed. Will you glance through them and decide?' The papers were handed round, carefully examined by most of the present, and the President's decision being endorsed, they were consigned to the flames. "'This,' said the President, with a certain amount of solemnity, is our account of the Tsarevich's abduction, as planned and executed by us. And this is the letter, which Taranyev must find means of conveying into Alexander the Third's own hands. These two papers, together with this small bundle of notes and plans, relating to our brotherhood, are the vital things that we will entrust to our messenger for safe delivery into Taranyev's keeping. We are thus not giving into his hands not only our own lives and liberty, who are assembled here to-night, but the last hopes of Donizhevsky and our unfortunate companions who are in prison. Would to God there was no such necessary for so much written matter! 
hopelessly compromising so many of us to be taken across the frontier, but unfortunately that necessity is an imperative one, and we must remember that we all may trust our messenger implicitly. All eyes now turned towards Ivan Volensky. As, almost trembling with emotion, he had received from the President's hands the letters and papers which were held out towards him. Descended from an ancient and once glorious family, Ivan Volensky was now the private secretary and confidant to His Eminence Cardinal d'Orsay, the Papal Nuncio, accredited to the courts of Paris, Vienna and Petersburg. But the Polish blood within him could not rest peacefully in the midst of comfortable surroundings. The spirit of plotting peculiar to his countrymen, fanatical, hot-headed and enthusiastic, had thrown him into the arms of this socialistic brotherhood, for whose sake he daily risked his position, his liberty, his very life. In the midst, as it were, of diplomatic and social life, Ivan Valensky was a priceless ally to these plotters, who needed men of his stamp, that mixed in with the very society they wished to annihilate, and could keep them well informed of the comings and goings of the exalted personages whom they wished to attack. It was Valensky who found out for his comrades that the Salvich was in Vienna under the strictest incognito, attended only by an elderly court functionary and a confidential Russian valet, and staying at the Hotel Imperial under an assumed name, and in the guise of a private gentleman remaining in town to view the carnival. Then it was that the daring plan was conceived by some of these fanatics, to obtain possession of so august a hostage, and then bar to his liberty against that of some comrades in Russia, who, implicated in an abortive intrigue, were awaiting condemnation, languishing in a Moscow prison. Ivan Volensky now leaned across the table, and said, turning towards the President, "'I am happy and proud to feel that it is my power to render the Brotherhood so great a service. I will convey the letter, the news, and the papers safely to Petersburg.' Many hands were stretched across the table towards the young Pole, who grasped them warmly. "'When can you start?' asked Merkovich. "'In about two days,' replied Ivan. "'Too late. Cannot you go before?' "'Impossible. The nuncio leaves Vienna the day after to-morrow. I shall be forced to remain twenty-four hours longer to finish and classify his correspondence. After that I am free, and can start immediately.' "'Let Ivan act as he thinks best,' said the President. "'Not one of us could cross the frontier as safely as he, and a delay of three days is not so dangerous as the entrusting of the papers to any one else.' "'So far I have never been suspected,' said Valensky reassuringly. "'True, those brutes on the frontier did seize and search all my papers once,' he added sullenly. "'That was after Dunajevska's arrest, when every Pole was an object of that type of tyranny. Fortunately, I was not carrying anything compromising then.' "'And this time?' asked an anxious voice. "'I shall take the precaution of wrapping our papers in an envelope, which I shall stamp with the seal of the papal legation. My position is well known, and the papers will be safe enough.' "'Fairly safe, shall we say?' retorted a grim voice from the further end of the room. "'Anyhow, it is obvious that we can have no safer messenger than Ivan,' decided the President. "'His is the only plan that promises the slightest measure of safety.' A general murmur of approval confirmed his decision. "'In four days, then, from now, I pledge to you my word that these papers will be handed over by me to Taraniev and the Petersburg Committee,' said the young Pole with fervour together with the news of the glorious act we have accomplished to-night, which is to result in the freedom of Donajewski and our other comrades, whom we had looked on as lost. And will you tell me now, as my duties with his eminence may prevent my seeing you before I start, what you propose to do in the meanwhile? There is very little we can do, said the President. Some of us will watch Lavrovsky, others Madame Demidoff. If there is the slightest suspicion of them moving in the matter and calling in police aid, we will convey to them the same warning that Taraniev will submit at headquarters. "'Remember, Volensky,' added another member of the committee, "'that our anxiety for the safety of our papers and of you, our messenger, will have reached its culmination point on the fourth day from this, and that if you can do so with prudence, try to communicate with us as soon as you have seen Taraniev.' "'I will certainly do so,' said Ivan. "'Never fear. The papers will be quite safe.' As soon as I have delivered them, I shall find my way towards the frontier, where I shall await Donajevsky and our comrades with the money the committee has entrusted me with for them. They will be in need of that. Moreover, I shall be very happy to shake hands with them and tell them, for they shall be ignorant of it, how we effected their release. 
The discussion was closed now. Cigarettes and pipes appeared once more, and with a quiet hum of conversation, where no mention of plot or tsar was made, took the place of an enthusiastic discussion. The President was chatting quietly with Volensky, who had slipped the precious papers into his breast pocket. Ivan was the first to rise. "'I must leave you all now,' he said. "'When we meet again it will be on my return from Petersburg, when our great work is all complete, and Donizhevsky, with our comrades, are free once more to join us in studying how best to accomplish the wheel of Russia and her people. "'Good night, all. "'Good night. "'Godspeed.' A score of hands were stretched out towards him, their friend, their comrade. In the minds of some of them, perhaps, there rose the thought that they might never see their daring messenger again, but these who had these thoughts were the older men, those who knew that no scrap of paper is ever really safe in Russia. Inwardly they called forth a blessing, and perhaps a prayer, for his safety, as he shook hands with all his friends. They were all preparing to depart, as they obviously could discuss nothing further that evening, and most of them, though socialist at heart, were also young besides, and longed to take a last glance at the merrily lighted streets of the city, the gay festivities of the carnival. And ten minutes later these men, who had so daringly organised, so successfully carried through, one of the most audacious plots in the annals of secret societies, were mixing gaily with the mad throng, bandying jests with merry masks, and seemingly forgetting that there were such things as princely hostages and secret missions, or that one of their comrades, their chosen messenger, would soon, holding all of their lives in his hands, have to convey their secrets to Petersburg, in the very teeth of the most astute police in the world. End of chapter 3 Chapter 4 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ivan Volensky has spoken gaily, reassuringly to them all, but what did he know of his own chances of safety across the Russian frontier? Practically nothing. Suspect? Ha! Anybody might at the moment become suspect to the Russian police. And then, that anybody's name is placed on the list. After that, let him try to get across with papers, valuables, secrets, and he will soon find what it means to be a suspect. What did Volensky know of how he stood in the eyes of the Russian police? Living mostly abroad and consorting, in a great measure, with his own exiled countrymen, some small degree of suspicion was bound to remain attached to his name. He was a Pole, and, being a Pole, he conspired, not because he believed in all the utopian theories set forth by his brother conspirators, but because it was in his blood to plot and plan against the existing government. Whether these plots and plans ever resulted in anything tangible, any great reform out there in Russia, he never troubled his mind much to think. He was too young to think of the future. The present was the only important factor in his existence. He usually shrank from extreme measures. Murkovich's bloodthirsty speeches grated upon his nerves, and having spent some time a miracle of ingenuity in combining some deadly plot that would annihilate the tyrant and his brood, Ivan would have preferred that it should not be carried out at all but left as a record of what a Pole's mind can devise against his hated conquerors. It was not indecision, it was horror of a refined and even plucky nature, of deeds that would not brook the light of day. He would have liked to lead a Polish insurrection, but feared to handle an assassin's dagger. He had vague theories about the people, lofty notions of their immense brain-power, downtrodden by powerful officialism, and he looked forward to the days when that somewhat undefinable quality would frame its own laws, appoint its own rulers. How that great object was to be accomplished he had no practical notions. Murkovich said by killing those in power. Lobkovich, their much decorated president, said by careful diplomacy, and an occasional wholesome fright. The younger men dreamed, and the older ones plotted, and still the throne of the Romanovs was far from tottering and Ivan dreamed with the dreamers, and plotted with the plotters, eager to help, yet shrinking from decisive action. He had discovered the Tsarevich's proposed incognito journey to Vienna, and the Opera Ball. He was a young man of fashion in society, invaluable to the socialists, for he went everywhere, heard all the gossip, and repeated to them what they wished to hear. He planned out the abduction in all its details. Murkovich was to lend his house, in which to receive the captive, and his daughter was to entice him therein. 
Balakin and his brothers were to watch the proceedings. After that he, Ivan, would do something perilous, all alone. He cared not what, as long as he did not have to lend a hand in abducting a helpless youth into a dangerous trap. Nicholas Alexandrovitch had fallen into that trap, with his eyes shut, wholly unsuspecting. It had been well set at the time and place where most young men, be they prince or peasant, are eager for adventures, and the Tsarevich was barely twenty, and had come to Vienna to enjoy himself. The bright eyes of the Odalisk, as seen through her black velvet mask, seemed full of promise of enjoyment to come. Her manners, essentially Viennese, were provoking to the verge of distraction, and human nature, ever disguised in the garb of the heir to an empire, would have to undergo very radical changes, ere at twenty years of age it could resist the blandishments of so enterprising an Odalisk. He had jumped into the fake after her, only thinking of those bright eyes and provoking ways, and the short journey between the Opera House and Hoymarkt only ended in more complete turning that young head, and subjugating the inflammable heart, for, during those five minutes, Nicholas had succeeded in dislodging the black velvet mask, and in ascertaining that the charms that it held hidden were equally enchanting as those it had revealed. Perhaps had he been less young, and therefore more observant, he would not have failed to notice that a slightly sarcastic look hovered around the dainty childlike mouth, and a look, was it of pity, gave those bright eyes an added charm. Nefeka had stopped under a portico that would have seemed dreary and desolate beyond description to the most casual observer, but Nicholas Alexandrovitch flew up the great dark stone staircase with no thought save for the dainty figure that ran swiftly up some few metres in front of him. He followed her through a massive door, behind which he had seen her disappear, and found himself in a brilliantly lighted, dome-like hall, where a well-laden supper-table occupied the centre, looking most tempting, whilst a valet, in irreproachable attitude, mute and expectant, stood by. As the heavy door fell to behind him with a loud and reverberating crash, Nicholas Alexandrovitch, looking around him, realised that the fair Odalisk had once more disappeared. A door at the opposite end of the hall was open. Nicholas passed through it, to find himself in a comfortably furnished bedroom, obviously arranged for a bachelor's wants. It seemed to have no other egress but the door at which the Tsarevich stood still, amazed, wondering where that bewitching Khoury had given him the slip. Somewhere on that dark stone staircase, no doubt, and Nicholas pondered as to whether he should endeavour to follow her in that game of hide-and-seek which she appeared to have at her fingers' ends, or calmly await her return, which could obviously not be long delayed. The valet still stood, correct in attitude and dress, mute and expectant. His intense impassiveness grated on the young prince's turbulent nerves, strung to aching point whilst waiting for the odalisque who did not reappear. Then it began to strike him as strange, that though the supper appeared sumptuous and plentiful, it had only been laid for one, for the unknown odalisque, no doubt, but then the bedroom adjoining was obviously not a lady's room. Nicholas frowned, and forced his nerves to be still, and his brains to recommence to act. A breath of suspicion, the first, seemed to have crossed his mind. He walked deliberately to the door. It was locked. It did not surprise him. The breath of suspicion had suddenly developed into a hurricane of doubt. "'Where am I?' he asked the valet. The latter bowed very humbly and pointed to his own ears and mouth, shaking his head the while. "'Real or assumed?' was the Tsarevich's mental query. Obviously it was no use to try and force that door. It looked solid enough to resist an assault. Nicholas understood that he had been trapped, for what purpose remained yet to be proven. A few moments elapsed, then the door was gently opened from without. The deaf-mute valet went up towards it. The thought of making a rush for that same door may have presented itself to Nicholas's mind then, but fortunately the humiliation of an unsuccessful attempt was spared him, for behind the door stood two stalwart mujiks, equally mute as their comrade, and equally correct in bearing. One of them stepped forward, and with deep obeisance presented a letter to the Tsarevich, who tore it open impatiently. A few words only, to tell him what he already knew, that he was a helpless prisoner without hope of escape his life inviolate, but held as hostage, pending negotiations with his exalted father, which no doubt would soon terminate in a most satisfactory way. And in the meanwhile the lodgings, poor as they were, were entirely at the august prisoner's disposal, as well as three deaf-mute mujiks, told off to do his bidding. Nicholas Alexandrovitch called himself a fool, 
than tried to become a philosopher. He had every confidence in the far-seeing, far-reaching police of his country, trusted to Lavrovsky to use every effort and every dispatch, and resigned himself to the inevitable with the character placidity of his race. One last tribute to youth and folly he paid, when he felt an aching pang at the thought that the provoking Odalisk had only used her blandishments for purposes so far removed from his poetic imagination. The next half-hour saw the heir of the Tsar of all the Russias eating a sumptuous supper all alone, and a prisoner, with a youthful appetite and no thoughts for the morrow. As for Count Lavrovsky, in attendance upon his Imperial Highness, he, no doubt, was in a worse position than his abducted charge. To have allowed the Tsarevich, for whom he was, so to speak, responsible, to so completely slip through his fingers was an event unparalleled in the history of a Russian courtier. No doubt, the case being unprecedented, the punishment would be equally so, and Lavrovsky, already half an hour after the Tsarevich's disappearance, could, when shutting his eyes, see visions of convicts, of prisons, of mines, and Siberia. Half an hour is a long time for the son of the Tsar to remain unattended, and when two or three hours had slipped by and the crowds of mummers had begun to thin, Lavrovsky began to enduring mental tortures he had up to that time had no conception of, and when, presently, at some small hour of the morning, the last of the giddy throng were preparing to depart, the old Russian still sat staring into the crowd, cramped in body, and with mental faculties rendered numb with nameless terrors. The officials asked him to leave. The lights were being turned out and Lavrovsky had perforce to leave his box and find his way onto the streets. One or two discreet questions from porters and attendants about an odalisk and a domino brought only mirth for an answer. Fifty odalisks, two thousand dominoes, had passed up and down the Opera House steps during the last few hours. At the Hotel Imperial, the sleepy hall porter had not seen the young stranger, and the Russian valet, the only attendant to the young Tsarevich, made a mute inquiry as to his master, which he dared not put into words. The man would have to be told something. He was trustworthy. He might be of help. Lavrovsky told him half a truth. The Tsarevich had thought fit to go on a young man's escapade. They, too, must keep that a secret. Nicholas Alexandrovitch might return to-morrow. He might be away for some days. Count Lavrovsky could not say. He relied on Stefan to be discreet. The next day, when no news came, the old Russian began to look longingly at a tiny revolver he always carried with him. Better that than to be dragged home to Russia, arraigned for high treason, and sent to Irkutsk to dig salt for the imperial exchequer for having neglected his duties as keeper and caretaker of the young heir to the throne. But Lavrovsky was over sixty, and at that age life seems very sweet, a dear friend we have known for so long, and therefore from whom we are loath to part. He replaced the pistol in his dressing-bag, and looked elsewhere for counsel and guidance. A good detective private, not official, might save the matter, and unearth the truant, if he were still alive. Well, if he were not, Lavrovsky's life was in any case not worth an hour's purchase, and the revolver would always be handy. Stefan asked no questions. Lavrovsky looked harassed and anxious, and that was sufficient information for the stolid Russian. The morning papers had no account of mysterious dead bodies found looted in the streets, and Lavrovsky sallied forth to seek a detective. They recommended him one at one of the newspaper offices, Monsieur Furet, a Frenchman, a man of wide experience and good connections. Lavrovsky went to him. He had tried so far not to think too much. The thoughts to which he did not allow coherence would have led him to a lunatic asylum, and he wished to keep his mind clear of all things, save his duty to his missing charge, and to the honour of his own name. Monsieur Furet was astute, wise, but not omnipotent. Lavrovsky told him too little. He felt it as he spoke. The detective, a Frenchman, guessed there was some mystery, and tried to probe the Russian's secrets. But Lavrovsky was obdurate. When the time came for throwing himself on the detective's discretion, he shrank from the task, dared not avow to him the identity of the missing stranger, and only spoke vaguely of him as a young foreigner of distinction. The matter was hopeless, and Mr. Furet was waxing impatient. Monsieur, he said at last, it seems to me that you have come here today with the idea of no doubt of enlisting my services in a cause which you have at heart, but also with a firm determination to keep your secrets to yourself. You will, I am sure, on thinking the matter over, see how impossible you have made it for me to be of much service to you. 
"'Can you do nothing, then?' asked Lavrovsky in despair. He seemed so dejected, so broken-hearted, that the detective glanced up at him with a certain amount of pity, and said, "'Will you go home, monsieur, and give the matter your full consideration, quietly and deliberately? Read the police news carefully, to ascertain that no mysterious death has occurred, or unknown dead body found. I, in the meanwhile, will make what exhaustive inquiries I can, both at the upper house, the faker stations, and at the different railways. Your truant may, after all, reappear in the next day or two. Young men are often led into adventures that last longer than two or three days. Then come back and see me on a Saturday afternoon, but come back armed with the determination to tell me all. If you cannot bring yourself to do that, do not come at all. And in that case, if I, in the meanwhile, have not found the slightest clue, I will consider the matter dropped as far as I am concerned. And now, will monsieur excuse me, my time is valuable, and I have many clients to see. Monsieur Fure rose, the interview was over. Lavrovsky felt there was nothing more to be done unless he fully made up his mind whether he could confide in a third person or not, and that, for the present, he was not prepared to do. The Frenchman might, after all, be speaking truly. There was every chance that the Tsarevich was but perusing a young man's adventure, and nothing further could be lost by waiting. If those who had abducted him had meant any harm to him, the harm would by now be accomplished, and the three days Lavrovsky gave himself as a respite, either for the return of the prodigal, if he was alive and unharmed, or for throwing himself on the Tsar's doubtful mercy, if evil had come to Nicholas Alexandrovitch, could matter little. He took up his hat, and promising Monsieur Furet to think the case over, in the light he had suggested, bowed to the old detective, and soon found himself in the streets once more. He had determined to wait till Saturday, therefore wait he would, without confiding in any one, still trusting that this terrible adventure would end happily before then, and in the meanwhile bearing his own burden of anxiety alone. The only person that would of necessity require some sort of explanation, humble in position though he was, was Nicholas's valet. However little intelligence the man might possess, it would yet strike him as suspicious that his master should leave the hotel, and stay with friends so unexpectedly that he did not even arrange for the most ordinary necessities of his toilet to be brought to him. Lavrovsky, therefore, determined to tell him the partial truth truth, that is to say, such as he himself would wish it to be. "'You must understand, Stefan,' he explained, "'that his Imperial Highness has thought it fit to absent himself from this hotel for two or three days. But before leaving he gave me the strictest injunctions that we are to keep his absence the most profound secret from everybody, both here and at home. It is not for you, or even I, to question that Sarvich is right to do as he pleases. All we can do is to obey his orders.' as accurately as we can. To everybody, therefore, his Imperial Highness is confined to his bed with an attack of German measles, which is not serious, but might last some days. Now, do you quite understand me? And can his Imperial Highness entirely rely upon your fidelity and discretion both now and in the future? Nicholas Alexandrovitch is my master, said the Russian simply. He has always found me faithful when he wanted my help. Silent when he required my silence. The words I speak are as much at his commands as the deeds I do. I will say what he wishes, or hold my tongue as he desires. That is well, Stefan, said Count Lavrovsky. Be sure his Imperial Highness will remember what you do for him today. Lavrovsky knew he could rely on this man. All was well then for the next two days. After that, in God's hands, he thought, with characteristic Oriental fatalism. End of chapter 4、chapter、five of the Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. And must your eminence really leave us tomorrow? said the Emperor Franz Joseph I, with polite regret, as Cardinal d'Orsay, papal nuncio accredited to the court of Vienna, prepared to rise for the final leave taking. Indeed, your Majesty. Did not most imperative duty call me away, I would never of my own accord have left this charming and hospitable city. As it is, the cardinal sighed, and a resigned expression crossed the aristocratic features of this martyr to his duty. I am glad indeed to think your eminence has found Vienna so attractive. 
Oh, not so much Vienna, Your Majesty, so the city is delightful in itself. But the Viennese... The Cardinal paused. For once in his diplomatic career words failed him, with which to convey his thoughts of this interesting subject. "'You will find in the Grand Dame of St. Petersburg formidable rivals to those of Vienna,' said the Emperor pensively. His Eminence did not reply. He recollected one or two little perfumed breaths of scandal that had reached his ears, of how one of those Grand Dames of St. Petersburg had, last winter, found in Franz Josef's large and inflammable heart an undisputed, if somewhat temporary, place. There was silence for a few moments. The Emperor was evidently ill at ease. His hand was toying nervously with the trifling knick-knacks that adorned his writing-table. Whilst once or twice he seemed as if about to speak, then checked himself abruptly. The Cardinal, whose long diplomatic career had taught him the science of quiet patience, leant back in his chair and waited for what, he knew, the Emperor still wished to say to him. "'Your Eminence will be seeing many of my old friends at St. Petersburg,' said the Emperor at last, with evasive irrelevance. "'I will make a point of seeing all those your Majesty would wish me to see,' replied the Cardinal, with pointed courtesy. "'Your Eminence is most kind, and I feel sure will convey my friendly greetings to the Tsar and Tsarista in a far worthier manner than my poor pen could express. I would also wish to be kept in the bon souvenir of the Grand Duchess Zinia and the Grand Duke, of whose last visit to Vienna I have such agreeable recollections. The Cardinal smiled imperceptibly, and his eyes rested for an infinitesimal space of time on a dainty miniature, set in old paste, which no doubt portrayed one of those agreeable recollections. Swift as had been the Cardinal's glance, Franz Josef evidently had caught it, for he added somewhat nervously, "'And do not forget to lay my humble respects at the feet of the Princess Marionov, who, I trust, will soon visit Vienna again, the scene of her last carnival's triumphs. Any written or verbal message your Majesty deigns to entrust to me with will be safely delivered,' once more assented Cardinal D'Orsay. "'Take care!' said the Emperor, with a nervous laugh. I may take your eminence at your word, and send such voluminous messages as will encumber your overladen trunk. My services are at your Majesty's command. The Emperor looked keenly for a moment or two longer at his eminence's astute diplomatic face. Then, as if obeying a sudden impulse, he took a small key from his pocket, and, opening one of the larger drawers of his writing-table, he carefully pulled out a voluminous parcel and placed it before Cardinal D'Orsay's astonished gaze. "'And if I were to ask your eminence to let my message take this form?' said Franz Joseph at last. Throughout his career his eminence had never once been taken wholly by surprise, but this time, just for the space of a second, his deep-set eyes seemed to open a trifle wider than usual with astonishment. "'The message, in fact, is a souvenir,' continued the Emperor. "'A mere trifle.' that will make the recipient remember Vienna and the Viennese in a way I would wish her to do. Her? Yes. Ah, I understand. The Grand Duchess Xenia, said His Eminence, with a thought of malice. No, not the Grand Duchess. She would not value works of art such as these. They are works of art, of the rarest kind, and intended for a connoisseur who will know how to appreciate them. Will your Majesty deign to name that connoisseur? The Princess Marionov. Oh! She has often admired these bibelots, and it is not always in our power to completely gratify a beautiful woman's whim. I am anxious to show your eminence the humble gift that I will ask you to lay at the Princess's feet. With infinite care and patience, the Emperor, with his own hands, proceeded to unfold the parcel from its numerous papers and wrappings and presently displayed before His Eminence's admiring gaze a pair of the most dainty, most valuable china candlesticks that ever adorned a Marquise's boudoir. Each candlestick represented a Cupid, in that rarest of all wares known as a Vieux Vienne, with arms outstretched, shooting a golden arrow from a gigantic bow at an imaginary target. The feet were firmly planted upon a basis of exquisitely chased gold, the figure slightly leaning against the trunk of a tree, which was pure gold, and the branches of which formed the receptacle for the candles. Truly a charming and appropriate gift, 
said the cardinal, in admiration, though with a touch of sarcasm. Ever since he had realised the nature of the message, the Emperor wished to convey to his cher ami, his eminence had seemed decidedly less eager to place his services at Franz Joseph's disposal. The candlesticks seemed so fragile, and yet would be so cumbersome, that Cardinal d'Orsay almost shuddered at the grave responsibility of taking about so much brittle ware with him, across some two thousand miles of country. But the Emperor appeared wholly unconscious of the Cardinal's lack of enthusiasm. With the eagerness of a connoisseur, he pointed out the exquisite modelling of the china, and the dainty chasing of the gold. "'And to add to the charm and the rarity of the bibelot, he added, "'these candlesticks contain a thought of mystery. "'Will your eminence press very lightly on this small leaf "'that stands apart from the rest on this little gold twig?' "'The cardinal obeyed good-humouredly, "'and to his astonishment saw that the leaf contained a tiny spring, "'which, when touched, displayed a hidden receptacle, velvet-lined, "'in the hollow of the tree-trunk.' "'The secret spring is the most interesting feature of these candlesticks,' explained the Emperor. "'My great-aunt, the unfortunate Marie Antoinette, succeeded in sending a most important message to her brother through the medium of these innocent-looking bibelots and the help of Monsieur de Newpurg. The Cardinal had often heard the story of the secret means Monsieur de Newpurg found of taking the unhappy Queen's messages safely across the French frontier. Surely these candlesticks, then, were an heirloom, almost a relic. They had, he had heard, stood in the Hofburg chapel since the unfortunate Queen's death, until the day when a pair of beautiful Russian eyes had looked at them longingly, and now the treasures were gaily passing out of the martyr's family for ever. The Cardinal was silent. He would have given a good deal had he found some remotely plausible excuse for not executing the Emperor's commission. He foresaw all kinds of eventualities, resulting in fractures to the dainty china limbs, or even to the gold branches and leaves, and saw terrible visions of arriving at St. Petersburg with half a cupid and a leafless trunk. "'I need not add, I feel sure,' said His Majesty, breaking a silence that threatened to become awkward, "'that I entirely rely on your eminence's discretion in the matter. You see, both the Queen Regent of Spain and the Comtesse de Paris have perhaps a right in thinking that these candlesticks should not pass out of my hands into any but theirs, and I would prefer that my subjects should know nothing of this delicate mission which I beg your eminence to accept for me.' "'Your Majesty may quite rely upon me. My discretion has, I think, been often tried, and never been found wanting.' There was a want of cordiality about His Eminence's manner now, but the Emperor was too intent on once more packing up his treasures to notice a trifling detail of that sort. He had secured an emissary, the most discreet in Europe, for the conveying of his gift, and he was determined not to give him a chance of taking back his half-given word. The candlesticks were once more safely packed up, and the Emperor seemed eager not to prolong the interview, now that he had his wish and Cardinal d'Orsay's final promise. "'I shall never cease to be grateful to your eminence for this friendly service,' he said finally, and stretched out a cordial hand towards the Cardinal, with that happy mixture of dignity and bonhomie that is the characteristic feature of the Habsburgs, and that no one yet has been able to resist. The Cardinal bowed low over the imperial hand, and though his face wore the resigned expression of a martyr to duty, he contrived to take a final farewell of Franz Joseph that left a cheering impression on that much harassed monarch's mind. A few minutes later, Cardinal d'Orsay was in his carriage on his way home, a voluminous parcel on the seat in front of him, and a look of suppressed annoyance on his usually impassive face. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It had already been settled some little time ago that his eminence Cardinal d'Orsay would leave Vienna on the day following, Thursday, to take two or three weeks' relaxation from his diplomatic duties, under the strictest incognito, somewhere among the mountains of Bohemia. He had terminated his mission from His Holiness Leo the Thirteenth to His Catholic and Apostolic Majesty Franz Joseph the First, with that ease and tact which characterised all His Eminence's methods of procedure, whether diplomatic or otherwise, and would presently be going to St. Petersburg also on a diplomatic mission, but one of a most intricate character, which would require all His Eminence's skill and knowledge of the world, and of that imperial enigma, the Tsar. 
Ivan Volensky had been kept incessantly at work all that day, ever since his eminence had returned from the low mass, classifying and arranging the diplomatic correspondence relating to the concluded mission, and preparing the documents that the nuncio would require when, having returned from his well-earned holiday, he would be ready to start for St. Petersburg. Ivan had worked hard, chiefly to calm his agitation and force his mind to wander away from visions of various possible occurrences on the dreaded Russian frontier, which had haunted him during the night. Also, he was anxious to conclude all his duties connected with the legation. He was eager to start as soon as possible, to hand over the terrible responsibility of the papers, which already was weighing him down heavily. It was late in the afternoon when his eminence returned from his final leave-taking of His Majesty. Ivan, who was waiting for him, noticed at once the look of annoyance that seemed to ruffle the Cardinal's placid features. "'Cardinal proposes, and Emperor disposes,' said His Eminence wearily, after he had with the greatest care deposited his precious burden on the table. "'Ivan, my son, I have bad news to tell you.' The "'Bad news, Your Eminence? Don't look so scared, my son. It is merely a matter of great inconvenience and of bitter disappointment. I shall not be able to go to Carlsbad to-morrow.' "'Oh?' "'No.' I am to be Cupid's messenger instead. Truly a novel form of diplomacy, even after my years of experience. And this, added his eminence, pointing to the bulky parcel on the table, is the message I am to take. But I do not understand. Where is the message to go to? asked Polensky, somewhat amused at the clerical diplomat's ruffled composure. All the way to St. Petersburg, my son, to be laid at the most beautiful feet in the world, those of the Princess Marionov, on behalf of His Catholic and Apostolic Majesty Franz Joseph I. And your eminence has undertaken to convey this unwieldy parcel all the way to St. Petersburg, and are giving up your holiday in order to satisfy the Empress Caprice? asked Volensky in astonishment. What could I do? said the Cardinal impatiently. You know how insinuating the Habsburg family can be, its respective chief more so than any one in the world. His Majesty had extracted a promise from me, and forced these things into my hand before I had fully recovered from the astonishment in which his request had plunged me. So, now your eminence intends putting off your trip to Carlsbad indefinitely, and delivering the Emperor's message first of all, asked Ivan, who suddenly became nervous as to how these altered plans would affect his own movements. Yes, I am anxious to get rid of these brittle things, for brittle they are to an alarming degree. I should never know a moment's peace till they were out of my hands, and safe in those of the fair sorceress who has succeeded in inveigling Franz Joseph into giving us so precious an heirloom. We will start for St. Petersburg to-morrow. We? Oui? Yes, my son. I am afraid you must, like myself, find your holiday indefinitely postponed. Having once got so far, I shall push on to Peterhof at once, and see His Majesty the Tsar, for whom His Holiness has entrusted me with a memorial, and settle all my work in Russia with your help as quickly as possible. Polensky did not reply. In his mind there arose the fact of the great additional safety to his own secret mission, if he were actually travelling in attendance upon his eminence. Clearly this change of plans was for the good of the cause. "'I shall be quite ready to start to-morrow,' he said at last, with inconcealed clarity, and an involuntary sigh of relief. "'Well, you take it more philosophically than I do, my son,' said the Cardinal, sadly. "'After all, your eminence,' said Volensky, with an attempt at consolation, your holiday and mine are only postponed. In a month's time the spring will be upon us, the weather altogether more propitious for pleasure trips. In a month's time, my son, said the cardinal, whose gloom could not so easily be dispelled, there will no doubt have cropped up some work that again will brook no delay. There was no time like the present. In the meanwhile, said Ivan, will your eminence allow me to give the parcel to Antoine, that he may pack it in one of the boxes? Gently, my son, gently. Oh, you do not know the double annoyance these things are causing me, for not only do they necessitate the postponement of our holiday, but they are of such brittle nature that the conveying of them all the way to Petersburg will be one prolonged anxiety to bachelors like ourselves. Indeed? Yes, cut the string, my son, and look at the bibelot. You can feast your eyes on the most charming works of art it has ever been my good fortune to see, truly a fitting gift of an emperor to a princess. Polensky had already opened the parcel, and, with the eyes of a connoisseur, was admiring the exquisite workmanship, the grace of design, of these truly unique bibelots. "'Their history,' added his eminence, "'as His Majesty told me, is as interesting as the works of art themselves, 
The candlesticks are not entirely what they seem, and there is a charming secret about them. A secret? See, said his eminence, explaining to Ivan the intricacies of the hidden spring. History has it that Queen Marie Antoinette used these candlesticks as a means of sending private messages to her relatives in Vienna. The secret apparently has been well kept, for until now the Habsburgs never allowed these treasures to stand anywhere but in the Offberg Chapel, and no one, I believe, until this day has ever seen these mysterious receptacles. Belensky had turned pale with suppressed excitement. His hand slightly trembled, as, with unwanted eagerness, he now once more examined the Emperor's candlesticks. He listened to his eminence with an earnestness which was not wholly of a mere connoisseur. A wild, a grand idea had suddenly surged in his brain. Here was safety at last, complete, unassailable, a place wherein to deposit the valuable papers that not the most far-seeing Russian official could dream of. Moreover, the candlesticks themselves would be in his eminence's keeping, and who would dare touch the belongings of the papal nuncio? Now, for a little simple diplomacy, and then peace, comfort, freedom from anxiety, till, arrived at St. Petersburg, the papers safely across the frontier, he will have exercised the finest stroke of strategy ever done by any member of the secret society. "'Well, Ivan, what do you think of them?' his eminence's voice broke in, on Volensky's meditation. "'They are certainly most exquisite works of art,' said the young man, pulling himself together. "'But I do not wonder that your eminence is anxious about them. They seem so brittle, so fragile, that one fears damage even in the packing. That is why I dare not trust them to Antoine, and I hoped, Ivan, that you would see to the packing for me yourself. My own fingers are old and clumsy. It really requires a woman's hand.' "'No woman's hand can be more careful than mine shall be,' said Ivan eagerly. "'I will see about these things at once. They will be safest, I think, in your eminence's own valise, which can then be placed in the coupé and remain under our own eyes the whole length of the journey. "'You certainly will be relieving my anxiety very considerably, my dear son, by taking charge of these candlesticks for me. I can assure you that no diplomatic burden has ever weighed so heavily on my shoulders as these fragile bibelots. Fate seemed definitely to have placed herself in league with Volensky's project. Being a Pole, he was superstitious, and sought for the mysterious workings of some supernatural agency in this most ordinary event. He was brave in danger, with control over his nerves and fears, but this was an eager kind of emotion, that of joy, relief, triumph, and his arms shook as he carried the precious candlesticks up to his own private room. He wished to be alone to think quietly over the matter not to allow his eagerness to run away with his reason. His comrade's safety was the important fact to bear in mind, and that he would undoubtedly be furthering by concealing the papers in the secret receptacle. He was excited, enthusiastic. God's hand, he thought, protects the cause. He placed this secret within my reach, and now in two days Taranyev can have the papers. His eminence will have charge of them. The papal nuncio himself will unwittingly convey them across the frontier. His eminence could not be a suspect, that was clear. If he declared a parcel to contain works of art belonging to himself, not the chief of the third section in person would dare to lay hands on the cardinal's property. And feverishly he touched the secret spring of one of the candlesticks, and gazed almost lovingly into the velvet-lined receptacle within. Once more assuring himself that his door was safely locked, he took from out of his breast-pocket the papers entrusted to him yesterday by the committee, slipped them inside the hollow of the tree-trunk, and carefully closed the spring again. Then he minutely examined the two candlesticks, and ascertained that the china cupid who was now guarding the papers had a slightly damaged arm from wrist to elbow, which made it easily recognisable from its twin. He then wrapped them up carefully in many layers of cotton wool, and multitudinous soft papers, and taking the precious parcel to the cardinal's room he locked it up in his eminence's valise, side by side with the episcopal ring and the other insignia of his sacred calling. "'Yes, Your Eminence, you shall take our papers to St. Petersburg for us, "'hidden in the gift of an emperor to a princess. "'They will be safe enough there, I think.' Five minutes later, Ivan, calm once more, "'sought out the cardinal in his study. "'He handed him over the key to his valise "'and gave him the assurance that the emperor's candlesticks "'were quite safely packed, without fear of the slightest damage. "'I am infinitely grateful to you, my son,' said His Eminence. "'And now, as I am myself dining out, I think I may safely give you this, uh, your last evening in Vienna, to dispose of, and say good-bye to any friends you may wish to see. You will have to leave instructions about our intended departure by the morning's express, and be ready yourself for the journey. 
Good night, Ivan, and thank you. Polensky retired with a low bow, glad to think that he was off duty for the rest of the day. He hoped that sometime during the evening he would meet one or the other of his comrades, and be able to tell him to communicate with the others that, owing to the most propitious circumstances, he would start for Petersburg twenty-four hours sooner than was anticipated. They might, therefore, rest fully assured that the papers would be safe in Taranyev's hands by the Sunday morning at the latest, more especially as he would now be travelling actually with his eminence the nuncio, and that, therefore, there was not the slightest fear of his being asked unpleasant questions or having his papers examined. Those belonging to the Brotherhood he had placed in a hiding-place that was unparalleled for safety and defied the eyes of the keenest-sighted Russian official in the Empire. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. That same night, His Eminence, as he had told Ivan, was not dining at his hotel. He was spending an evening, the last of a series, in the company of Madame Demidoff, the most charming, the most mysterious, the most dangerous, of those Russian grand dames who haunt the societies of Vienna, Paris, and London, live on apparently boundless means, are received everywhere, admired by the men, envied by the women, and feared by the staff and even the head of the respective Russian embassies. Why the beautiful Madame Demidoff should be feared by her own compatriots, it were difficult for an Englishman or a Frenchman to say. She was always affable, equally so to every one whom she met in society, and appeared not to take the slightest interest in matters political. True, there had been a rumour a year ago that at the Austrian frontier one day an overzealous custom-house official, in inspecting the luggage of Madame Demidoff, who was going across to Russia, is said to have found some papers, wherein the lady gave a curiously minute account of all the sayings and doings of the Tsar's subjects residing in Vienna, including one or two intimate conversations between Monsieur l'Ambassadeur and Madame his wife that had actually taken place in their own bedroom, but this never got beyond a rumour, and the fact that a Monsieur l'Ambassadeur was shortly afterwards asked to retire from the diplomatic service may have had nothing to do with the intimate conversation which, after all, he had had with his wife between four walls, and one or two doors. Anyhow, His Excellency, the present ambassador, and all his staff, also Madame l'Ambassadrice, are always particularly amiable with Madame Demidoff, and ask her to all their most select parties, but the moment she leaves they sigh a sigh of relief, and when her name is mentioned before His Excellency he invariably says, Do not name her to me, it gives me a cold shiver down the back. However, all this was rumour, pure and simple. Nothing definite had ever been said that might throw suspicion of an ignoble calling on so fair an addition to Viennese smart society, and all uncharitable whispers were invariably suppressed by Madame Demidoff's numerous friends and admirers. Moreover, she entertained so superbly. Her little dinners were worthy of an ode by the court poet, and her balls were counted among the great functions of the season. One of these charming little dinners she proposed giving to-night to one of her most ardent, most valued friends, his eminence Cardinal D'Orsay, who never shamed his high ecclesiastical office by avoiding any pretty woman that was willing to help him to while away the tediousness of diplomatic negotiations. But she meant to leave for Petersburg that very evening by the midnight express, for it seemed to her beyond a doubt that some mystery was connected with the Tsarevich's chase after the odalisk at the opera ball last night and this mystery, unless more power were placed in her hands, she knew herself incapable of solving. She had seen nothing of Eugène during the day, and the evening was drawing on rapidly. She had but little hope of learning any important facts from him. The plot, if plot there were, once successfully carried through, proved how well all plans must have been laid. Time and place were in its favour, and the information gleaned by inquiries outside the Opera House where the crowd at the time of the abduction numbered hundreds of thousands, was sure to be of very meagre character. But at present she was actually ignorant as to whether the Tsarevich had, after all, returned to the hotel and the whole mystery burst as a soap-bubble. Then Lavrovsky's attitude would be interesting and important to note. There was a discreet rap at the door of the boudoir, where she had been waiting for the last half-hour, nervously pacing up and down the room, and at times sitting at her desk and covering sheets of paper with rapid scribbling. "'Ah, it is you, Eugène,' she said, as, in answer to her impatient to come in, 
The music's stolid figure appeared at the door. "'Well, have you learnt anything? Tell me as briefly as you can all the important points, while I make notes. You must be quick, for I can only spare a few minutes.' "'According to your Excellency's instructions,' began the Russian, "'I went at once to the Opera House, where the last of the masks were then departing, and the lights were being put out. I had conversations with most of the attendants, and some of the commissioners who had been stationed there, but no one seems to have taken much notice of the Odalisk, the Black Domino, or the Fiaca. They all, however, recollect an elderly gentleman, also in Black Domino, making similar inquiries to me, who seemed very agitated and disappointed when he could learn nothing. Lavrovsky, of course. Well, at the hotel this morning, I gathered that the Tsarvich has up to this moment not reappeared, for Count Lavrovsky, whom I followed at about two o'clock this afternoon, went off to the business house of a certain Monsieur Fure, who, as I learned from his concierge, is a very well-known and much thought of detective in this city. Hmm. I wonder what his hopes were in that quarter, mused Madame Demidoff. You are sure he did not send a telegram across to Petersburg first? Quite sure, Your Excellency. I am coming to that presently. What happened at the interview I, of course, cannot say, but what struck me was that when Count Lavrovsky left Monsieur Fure's office half an hour later, he seemed, if possible, more hopelessly dejected than before. I concluded from that— Never mind conclusions and surmises, my friend. It is facts we want to get hold of, said Madame Demidoff reflectively. No doubt that Lavrovsky did not dare to fully confide in this fury, and the detective thereupon would refuse to spend his time on a wild goose chase. What happened after that? There is very little more to tell, Excellency. Count Lavrovsky went straight back to the hotel, from whence he has not stirred all day. Stepan, the Russian valet, however, went out about five o'clock. I noticed he carried a piece of paper in his hand. I followed him to a telegraph office, and was fortunate enough to catch a glimpse of the contents as he handed it across the counter. And? It contained only a few words. Nicholas confined to his bed. Doctors say German measles. Not the last serious. Will be up in less than a week. Lavrovsky. Madame Demidoff sat still a while now, reflecting on what she had heard, her brows knit, buried in thought. To whom was the telegraph addressed? was the last question she asked. I could not see, Excellency, answered the man. I could only get one glance at it, and have told you the words that struck me. She had taken up a sheet of paper, and was making rapid notes of what she had heard. Little enough, it seemed, as she read them over, and she was tapping her foot with impatience and impotent energy. It seems pretty clear that Lavrovsky has made up his mind to wait, she said and is trying as best he can to keep ignorant at headquarters of the Tsarevich's disappearance. This is no doubt Fure's advice to him, who wants probably to have all the credit of discovering Nicholas's whereabouts, and the liberal reward that is sure in that case to be his. I care nothing for the reward, but this mystery alarms me. Lavrovsky, pah! An incompetent personage at best, nor a coward who thinks more of his own safety than of the dangers that at this moment surround the Tsarevich in his unknown prison. Pray to God, she added fervently, that it remains a prison, and not become a grave. Amen, said Eugen. Now, Eugen, that is, I think, all that you have to tell me. Your work, after I have left, will not be very difficult. Follow this man Fure wherever he goes. Glean every scrap of information you can. Remember, if anyone discovers the Tsarevich, it must be I and you, not they. You understand? A rumble of carriage wheels was now distinctly audible under the portico. Madame Demidoff hastily finished what writing she had to do, then locked her desk and dismissed Eugène, who disappeared, silent and stolid as he had come. Then it was that the consummate histrionic art, which this fascinating woman had at her fingers' ends, showed itself in a way that, to a hidden observer, would have seemed almost weird. In the space of less than a minute she seemed to have thrown off every vestige of anxiety and agitation. Her face was calm and smiling. The words of welcome to her exalted guest seemed ready to bubble forth. The hand that was cordially stretched forward was neither cold nor trembling. The lackey had thrown open the door, and announced, "'His Eminence the Cardinal Archbishop of Beauvais, Papal Nuncio!' 
"'Your eminence does my poor house too much honour," she said, with a gracious smile, while the cardinal, with the gallantry peculiar to his calling, kissed the tips of the dainty fingers that had been placed between his own. No wonder her countrymen were afraid of her. No wonder it was a slight shiver she occasioned at times in those who guessed what lay hidden behind the impassive mask of the Russian Grand Dame, the friend of princes, of kings and cardinals. Perhaps it was the terror of the unknown, a vague fear caused by this beautiful, impenetrable and certainly dangerous sphinx. As for his eminence not being a Russian, he had no cause to fear Madame Demidoff, but every reason to admire her, and sharpen his diplomatic wit against hers. As for shivers, they certainly were not cold ones, she gave him down the back. He saw in her a most brilliant and agreeable conversationalist, who knew everybody that was worth knowing, had been everywhere that was worth visiting. Her taste in matters artistic was unerring, her knowledge of interesting objets d'art the most complete on record. She had once written a most interesting pamphlet on the thimbles of Catherine the Second, another on the spurs of Peter the Great. She professed an ardent enthusiasm for the Roman Catholic Church, and showed an equally genuine one for its high dignitaries. Failing a trip to the Austrian Tyrol, his eminence thought the recherche little dinners on tête-à-tête -tête with Madame Demidoff the most consoling, most exhilarating holiday for his much-harassed mind. "'And your eminence is really leaving us to-morrow?' said the fair Russian, with a sigh. When, having adjourned to her dainty boudoir after dinner, she sat lazily reclining in an armchair a gold-tipped cigarette between her fingers and a pair of arch-black eyes fixed coquettishly on the reserved, impassive face of her vis-à-vis. -vis. "'It is unkind to speak of it at this early hour, madame, and embitter the last pleasing moments I shall spend in this delightful capital,' replied the cardinal. "'Come, come,' she added coquettishly. "'I did not know that diplomacy completely precluded truthfulness, even at the shrine of gallantry. If rumour speak correctly, your eminence is only leaving us for newer, and therefore more enjoyable scenes. Alas, cher madame, a rumour which spoke truly at more now talks falsely at even. I certainly had intended to go to Carlsbad for a fortnight's relaxation among the beautiful mountains. Incognito? she asked mischievously. Incognito, he smiled in reply. But alas, unforeseen duties have since called me elsewhere. Why, that is very sudden, she said. Monsieur Volensky, whom I met last night, told me that your eminence has completed your work, and were going on leave of absence for three weeks at least. Ivan Volensky told you what was quite correct last night, but, alas, has ceased to be so to-day, sighed his eminence with angry impatience. And your eminence is going, she asked, with truly feminine curiosity. He looked at her and smiled. She was bewitchingly pretty, smoking her cigarette with that infinite grace so peculiar to Russian women. Elsewhere, he said at last, as if in a vain attempt to check any further questions. But, experienced diplomatist as no doubt the papal nuncio was, this was a false move. For the word, as used by him, obviously hid a mystery. Madame Demidoff bit her lip. She disliked secrets, until they became her own. His eminence had quite unwittingly aroused her curiosity, and she had decided in her mind, in the space of a few seconds, that the cardinal should not leave her house to-night before having told her where he was going the next day. "'Elsewhere is a vague word,' she said poutingly, "'not to say ungallant. Your eminence has not accustomed me to such brusque answers.' Her annoyance, real or assumed, upset the inflammable cleric even more than her archness. Uh, "'Believe me, chère madame,' he said, full of contrition, "'that were the secret mine, I would confide it to you immediately, "'and not attempt to fence with words with you, "'which proceeding, I own, seem shockingly ungallant.' "'Ah, then you admit that there is a secret connected with your change of plans?' "'Nay, I never denied that. "'But this secret is not my own. "'Would it be the first time, then, "'that your eminence will have entrusted me with a secret "'which was not wholly yours?' she asked. Evidently the shaft told truly, but the cardinal did not reply. She saw she had gained a point. She was now burning with curiosity, and womanlike was more determined than ever to pierce his eminence's last attempts at mystery. I thought, she added, with real reproach in her voice, that when your eminence did me the honour to employ my poor services to aid you in some of your delicate diplomatic missions, that we had both agreed to share all political secrets with each other. This is not a political secret, chère madame protested the cardinal. Private, then? Ah, take care. 
my jealousy might prove more serious than my curiosity. Not my own, I repeat, hastily corrected the cardinal. Whose, then? she persisted. Your eminence told me that you had seen no one this Ash Wednesday, save Monsieur Volansky, and— She paused. In a moment she had guessed, and more than that, had guessed correctly. His eminence's conscious look spoke volumes. So your eminence is taking a secret private message from his majesty to some remote place elsewhere, she said, delighted at her first success. Aha! Now you cannot damp my curiosity any more. You must tell me all about it. For whom is the message? A lady, of course. The emperor's newest chère amie. I have it. The princess Marionov. Your eminence is going to Petersburg, with a billet doux from the emperor to the beautiful princess Marionov. Sure, madame, still feebly protested the cardinal. Ah, your eminence deserves that, after your want of confidence in me, I should publish the fact in the Viennese papers to-morrow. What a delightful paragraph it would make! A cardinal as Cupid's messenger. <laughs> Truly the secret is now mine, mine by right of conquest. Your eminence should have trusted a tried friend, and might have guessed that a mystery which baffles Madame Demidoff has yet to be invented, and is none of your or His Majesty's making. The cardinal was now truly distressed. His much boasted of discretion had received a very severe blow, and he was not at all confident but that this enigmatical woman would not take some unpleasant small revenge such as she threatened. Uh, "'Believe me, chère madame,' he ventured to say at last, that nothing but the most solemn promise to his majesty prevented my telling you from the first all that you wish to know. Madame Demidoff's powers of guessing riddles are too widely known for any poor diplomat like myself to attempt to battle against them. I can but throw myself, conquered as I am, entirely at your mercy. I will be generous to your eminence, she said, once more captivating and coquettish. Now that my whim is gratified, I can afford to be merciful. But on one condition only, and that is, that you tell me what it is you are taking over to the princess as a gift from her exalted admirer. It cannot be merely a billet doux, for the post would have been almost as safe as your eminence. Is it some rare and valuable gift? Diamonds? Pearls? Or objets d'art? It is indeed a most rare, not to say unique, gift, said the cardinal, now completely subjugated and resigned so absolutely valuable that no diamonds or pearls could ever have purchased them. Huh? Madame, remember, I am at your mercy. You will consider this in the light of a state secret. Have I ever been known to betray any secrets? she asked impatiently. So long as I have your promise. No need of a fresh promise. Surely your eminence knows me. Come, you have gone too far now to beat a retreat. Voila, it appears that last year the beautiful princess— in admiring the beauties of the Offberg, thought it fit to cast longing eyes on the celebrated candlesticks of gold and vieux vienne that had belonged to Marie Antoinette. Ah, yes, I have heard of them. They are said to be most exquisite works of art, and I believe many a member of the Habsburg family has longed in vain to possess them. Until the said pair of Russian eyes were cast on them with a pleading look, and an imperial heart was unable to resist, assented the cardinal. And his majesty? has asked me to lay these same candlesticks, together with the imperial and royal homage, at the dainty feet of his cher ami. And your eminence has accepted the task? With great reluctance, I assure you, cher madame. But what would you? His majesty has the faculty of opening even an old diplomatist's heart, as easily as he does the secret springs of his candlesticks. The secret springs? Yes. Did you not know the candlestick contains secret springs? with mysterious receptacles, that, according to history, contain many a time Marie Antoinette's private missives to her brother in Vienna. Oh, they are most interesting heirlooms, most fascinating bibelot. Madame Demidoff said nothing more. For a while she sat pensively watching the clouds of smoke as they rose from her cigarette, and her eyes wandered from time to time towards the cardinal, who sat absorbed in reflections, probably of that bohemian trip he was forced to abandon. "'Ah, how I wish I could see those candlesticks,' said Madame at last, with an impatient little sigh. "'Have you never seen them? They are certainly the most exquisite works of art it has ever been my good fortune to see.' "'Your Eminence, 
it is truly cruel to torture the soul of a humble collector like myself by telling me of treasures I shall now never behold. Would that be so great a hardship? he asked, smiling. Oh, do not laugh. I am simply burning with curiosity. All night I should dream of vervian candlesticks, of gold mounts, of secret springs. How can I imagine a thing that I know must surpass anything of the kind I have ever seen? It will be a nightmare, surely. Do not say that, monsieur, madame. Think of the tortures of remorse I shall have to endure, knowing that my momentary indiscretion in speaking of these bibelots has caused you a restless night. Why not avoid the remorse for yourself and the nightmare for me by gratifying my burning curiosity? With all the pleasure in life, said his eminence with clarity, if madame will honour me by stepping into my carriage and paying my dreary abode a visit, the candlesticks will but need unpacking. Oh, mon dieu, your eminence! What you propose will be très compromettant for me. I think of your servants, of Mr. Vlensky. Pardon me, madame, said his eminence. I am an old diplomatist, and I ceased to be compromising to a pretty woman many years ago. Diplomatists are always compromising, your eminence, and I really would not dare venture, for fear I should be punished by being forced to take the veil of a Carmelite. But, oh, she added, with a pretty gesture of entreaty, Will your eminence allow me to send my confidential maid to Monsieur Belensky and ask him to give her the candlesticks? I assure you, I shall not sleep a wink to-night, and to-morrow look as old as Madame Lambat and Dries, unless your eminence will satisfy my curiosity. Madame, among my numerous sins, which, alas, the recording angel put too faithfully marks against me, there has often occurred the sin of giving a lady a sleepless night, but never that of causing her to look a day older than her years. I feel sure such a sin would be beyond forgiveness. So, if you will allow me, I will ring for my carriage and drive to my hotel at once, in order to bring you the objects of your curiosity myself. I doubt if Volensky is at home at this moment. Moreover, I have the key of my valise, in which I know they are locked. Oh, your eminence is too kind, said Madame Temenov, with almost childish delight. You will gauge the extent of my curiosity by the fact that it has completely annihilated my courtesy inasmuch as I find it impossible to refuse your kind preposition. And, as if fearing that the cardinal might change his mind, she rang the bell, and ordered his eminence's carriage to be brought round immediately. The cardinal, very much amused at this old, yet ever new, trait of feminine curiosity, promised not to tarry a moment, and ten minutes later he took a temporary leave, and the roll of his carriage soon died away in the distance. Madame Demidoff sat for some moments quite still, unable to move, perhaps from sheer intensity of excitement, till the very last sound of those carriage wheels could be heard no more. A torpor, akin to a trance, seemed to have mastered this woman, usually so full of energy and vitality. But this did not last. Soon the reaction set in. How astonished would her urbane guest have been, had he been gifted with second sight, and now beheld the elegant, nonchalant grand dame, whom he had left lazily lounging in an armchair, toying idly with a cigarette. All eagerness and excitement, she feverishly opened her desk, and ran through the notes she had taken of Eugène's report as to the Tsarevich's disappearance, and Count Lvrovsky's pusillanimous behaviour. Every now and then short, jerky sentences found their way half audibly through her tightly clenched teeth. They were, as it were, the safety valves of this intense, inward excitement. For what a chance of complete secrecy had fate thus placed in her way! She shuddered as she recollected that hateful moment on the Austrian frontier, when, through blunder or over-officiousness, alien hands had come across her reports. Oh, the humiliation of it, the mockery of obsequious civility, palpably directed towards a dangerous enemy, a spy of the Russian government. Then the heavy hush-money, paid with a liberal hand, and yet evidently wholly inadequate to stop chattering tongues from propagating, oh, a mere whisper, the interesting fact, that Madame Demidoff, the elite of Viennese society, the friend of princes, kings, and cardinals, derived her great wealth from money paid to her for spying on her countrymen abroad. Some such news did get about, there was no doubt of that. She had felt vaguely conscious of it sometimes. Or was it the merest fancy? At any rate, there had been no certainty, and certainty there must not be, for Madame Demidoff loved her life, the gay, glittering court life, with the admiration her beauty and wealth aroused and the friendships, her bright wit, and a fascinating manner attracted around her. Her profession? Ha! Ah, as to that, English readers, try not to be too severe. Russia is a great but hard mistress, 
who demands all of her children work according to their means and ability. The word spy has an ugly meaning with us. We loathe it, if applied to a man, and cannot even conceive it as an attribute to a young and gifted woman. But in Russia, where all around an absolute monarchy, a reb of intrigue and conspiracy is woven, where blows are aimed and dealt at the head of the state from every quarter of the empire, from every class of society, and always from the dark, these blows must be met with counter-blows of the same nature, secret, swift, and dark. An enemy, hidden behind every pillar of a palace, can but be fought by means as secret as his own. Russia employs them to protect herself and her autocratic ruler. Blame the system if you will, and then try to pity its often unwilling servants. Madame Demidoff never allowed herself to reflect as to whether her calling was worthy of praise or blame. She served her country to the best of her ability, and continued coquetting with the world, whilst daily risking its contempt. However, on this occasion, fate evidently meant to be kind. The moment she heard His Eminence recount the interesting history of the Emperor's candlesticks, her bright wit had laid itself out for a means to obtain possession of those mysterious receptacles. In a few moments the Cardinal would be back with his precious burden, and surely she had carried through more difficult bits of diplomacy than that of inducing the nuncio to entrust her with the mission of conveying the candlesticks across the Petersburg. This report, merely a matter of a few notes taken by herself from Eugene's scanty account of the Tsarevich's disappearance, would lie easily concealed in the secret receptacle. It was not much, but, as no doubt it would reach the government sooner than any communication from the conspirators, it might be of some value. Madame Demidoff, well versed as she was in matters of this sort, felt convinced that the Tsarevich's abduction must have been carried through with a view to making some imperious demands, while he was a hostage in the conspirators' hands. She arrived very near the truth whilst thinking the matter over, and felt at the same time how helpless the Russian police, nay, the Tsar himself, would be, whilst Nicholas was a hidden prisoner. That Count Lavrovsky, who had been, perhaps innocently, very much to blame in allowing his charge to slip through his fingers, would endeavour to recover his traces by every possible and impossible means, there was certainly no doubt. Viennese detectives were known throughout Europe for their astuteness, and moreover a man like this Fure would not arouse the suspicions of the plotters in the way that an agent of the Russian government would. But Madame Demidoff had set her resolute mind the task of being the chief instrument in unmasking the daring conspiracy. She knew what high value her government set on her powers, and this was the greatest opportunity she had ever had of showing how worthy she was of their trust. She was an absolutely fearless woman, while engaged in the fulfilment of her duties. Any danger to her personal safety at the hands of revengeful plotters held no place in her thoughts. But there was the weak point in her armour. Was there ever human nature without such a point? And that weakness lay in her intense dread of being branded before the world, before all the friends she had made, as a spy. The name gave her a shudder, when, as it were, it stood up and rose before her, as it had done that terrible time on the frontier, when the catastrophe seemed imminent, and the bare thought of hearing it whispered around her by those who had held it an honour to be counted among her guests was at times overpoweringly intolerable. Perhaps in the pride of the woman of society, dreading to be forced to step down from her pedestal, there was much of that deeply hidden sentiment that changed this worldly politician into a mere woman at times, the sentiment that invariably brought into her eyes that look of wistful tenderness which she so rarely allowed to dwell therein. Perhaps when she thought of the exalted and high-born friends who would turn their backs with scorn on the paid spy of the Russian police, did she dwell lingeringly on the one friend, the dreamy, aristocratic young Pole, who thought, alas, so little of her now, but who would scorn her, oh, so completely then. But now, if only fate favoured her but a little longer, if she succeeded in inducing the Cardinal to allow her to take the candlesticks over herself to Petersburg, she need not have the slightest fear of discovery. She had looked through the papers, the report she wished to take, if the secret receptacles were as his eminence had described them, she could defy the most meddlesome officials on her perilous journey across the frontier. She heard once more the rumble of wheels. His eminence's carriage was stopping under her portico. A hasty glance at her mirror reassured her that no trace of either agitation or sentiment was visible on her face. Relighting a cigarette, she once more lounged back in her causeurs, and when, three minutes later, his eminence entered carrying his precious burden, he could read naught but ardent curiosity in his fascinating hostess's expressive eyes. With her dainty fingers she helped him to undo the numerous wrappings which Ivan Volensky, so little while ago, 
had so trustingly wrapped round the valuable bibelo. The enthusiasm of the connoisseur was apparently boundless, and Madame Deminoff was untiring in the praises she bestowed on the charming bibelo. "'But, oh dear me!' she sighed. "'How brittle!' "'Not so brittle as you may imagine,' said his eminence. "'For after all, these candlesticks are some three hundred years old. They must have been handled by scores of hands, and are still in perfect condition.' "'Not quite perfect, I think,' she replied. "'For see, this one little cupid has his arm sadly chipped from wrist to elbow.' "'Oh, mon Dieu!' said his eminence. "'I do hope this has been done before, and not since I have had charge of these inconvenient things. I assure you, chère madame, they are a source of constant anxiety to me, ever since His Majesty forced them into my hands. Pray do allow me to place the damaged candlestick on one side, or perhaps you will extend your kindness by wrapping it up once more in its coverings.' I dare not touch it for fear of damaging it further, and can show you the secret spring in the other, for they are both alike. Tenderly, as if it were a child, his eminence, with Madame Demenoff's help, had wrapped the damaged candlestick up in its many coverings once more, and had carefully placed it on one side. And now the fair Russian was eagerly watching the cardinal's fingers, as he pressed on the tiny gold leaf, and explained to her the mistress of the secret spring, and the hidden receptacle, so complete, so perfect, so absolutely free from any possibility of detection. Madame Demidoff could ill-conceal her excitement, and she nerved herself now to the task, the intricate bit of diplomacy that still lay before her. "'Ah!' she said at last. "'No wonder your eminence feels nervous and ill at ease with such fragile things in your keeping. You have no idea how careless the custom-house officials and railway porters are in Austria, with the boxes and valises belonging to men. With ladies' things, I notice, they are much more careful.' for they fear the consequences of a crushed gown or a torn piece of lace. "'You absolutely give me the shudders, chère madame,' said his eminence. "'I declare my life will be a perfect misery until the happy moment when they are safe in the Princess Marionov's hands, let alone the fact of my bitter disappointment in having to forego my long-projected holiday.' Madame Demidoff was still attentively examining the pretty bibelot as she said playfully, "'Would your eminence really care to give up the chance of being Cupid's messenger?' "'If I only knew the way to do that, chère madame,' he said, with an unmistakable sigh of relief, as he finally gave in to her kind persuasion. "'By telling me all the latest scandals about my best friends,' she said laughingly, settling herself once more comfortably in her luxurious armchair. The victory was gained, and for the next half-hour his eminence's sprightly conversation helped her to forget the agitations of the evening. He finally took his leave, leaving the bibelo that had caused him so much annoyance safely in her charge, and it was agreed that Madame Deminoff would take care of them until his eminence's return from Carlsbad, when he would hand them over himself to the Princess Marionov. Thus it was that her diplomatic gifts had once more stood her in good stead, and what she considered the safest possible hiding-place for her reports was now in her possession to make use of as she wished. It was getting late, and she was more resolved than ever to leave Vienna this very night, lest his eminence might change his mind on the morrow, and rob her once more of her precious charge. She collected the notes she had recently made, together with a few other papers containing her various reports to the third section, and, unconsciously imitating Volensky's actions, she touched the secret spring, and slipped the documents into the velvet-lined receptacle within the shaft of the candlestick. Safe they were, of that there was no doubt. She carefully packed up the precious bibelo in their numerous wrappings, wrote on the outside covering in bold letters, The property of His Eminence Cardinal D'Orsay, China, very fragile. Then took the parcel up with her, and put it away in her valise. An hour later, accompanied by her maid, who carried the fateful burden, she drove away to the Nordbahn, en route for St. Petersburg. At about the same time, Ivan Valensky, hearing the Cardinal's footsteps in the room below, knocked at His Eminence's door to inquire if he would require his services again that night. "'Come on, Ivan!' said the Cardinal, in highly elated tones. "'This time it is good news I have to impart to you. We shall both have our holiday, my son, and I start for Carlsbad to-morrow.' Ivan stared at his eminence in complete astonishment. "'But what about the candlesticks?' he asked breathlessly. "'Ah, that is the delightful piece of luck that has happened,' explained his eminence. "'Madame Demidoff, who is herself going to Petersburg to-morrow, has consented to take the tiresome things over for me and to keep them in her charge until my return from Carlsbad. I fetched them away myself this evening, and I am thankful to say that the responsibility of travelling with those brittle things is safely off my shoulders. Volensky had become deathly pale. Madame Demidoff, 
the, the candlesticks,' he gasped. "'I do not understand. "'Why, my friend, don't look so scared. "'I was showing the bibelo to madame, "'and quite casually mentioned that I was somewhat disappointed "'at having on their account to give up a long-expected holiday. "'So she very kindly offered to take the candlesticks "'over to Petersburg for me, "'which offer I gladly accepted. "'And you see me with a burden less on my mind.' Volensky was vainly trying to regain his composure. "'And did your eminence show Madame Demonoff the secrets of the candlesticks?' he asked breathlessly. "'I really do not remember,' said his eminence. "'I dare say I did, but you seem very anxious about the matter. I don't understand the reason. My anxiety is entirely in your eminence's interest. My fear is lest the candlesticks are really safe in a lady's keeping.' "'Is that all?' said his eminence, somewhat dryly and darting a quick glance from his penetrating eyes at Volensky, who bore the scrutiny bravely. "'You may set your mind at rest, then. I consider the candlesticks quite safe, my dear Volensky. So now good-night. I start early to-morrow morning. You will, I am afraid, have to stay another day longer, in order to see to the correspondence. But after that your time is your own, till we meet at Petersburg on the third of next month. Good-night, my son.' Volensky bowed low before the cardinal, and, more dead than alive, he reached the quietness of his own room, where he could collect his thoughts and view the immediate future. That the peril was deadly, that after this, at any hour, any moment, the blow might fall, he realised in one moment. All the papers relating to their plot, so carefully planned, so daringly executed, the draft of their manifesto to be placed by Taranyev in the Tsar's hands, documents which in most cases bore the names of the conspirators, and which would send them, one and all, if discovered, to Siberia or to death, all were contained in the secret receptacle of one of the candlesticks that even now were in Madame Demidoff's hands. All that required no reflection. They were hard, undeniable facts. What did need serious thinking, as the catastrophe had by some extraordinary stroke of good luck so far been averted, was how to ward it off successfully. In the first place it was quite evident that so far the papers were safe. The Cardinal and Madame Demidoff had seen nothing. Either His Eminence had forgot or forbore to show the lady the secret spring, or, having done so, he happened to have used the candlestick that did not contain the secret papers. But women are naturally curious, fond of toying with trifles, and any moment Volensky's thoughts refused to travel further. The consequences were too appalling. And then again, should he warn his comrades at once of the catastrophe, own to them that the trust they had placed in him he had even the first day betrayed. Would that serve any purpose? What could they do, even if they knew the worst, but calmly await events? For wherever they went, however they hid, it would be impossible to escape the far-reaching arm of the Russian police. No, far better let them remain in blissful ignorance for a time. If the blow was to fall, they would know their fate soon enough. Hour after hour the young Pole sat, his head buried in his hands, trying to think of some plan, some means of intercepting those candlesticks, of robbing Madame Demidoff. But how? How? All night he paced up and down his room. It was broad daylight before he fell into a troubled sleep, and in his dream chains were on his wrists. He and most of his comrades were tramping through a dreary desert of snow towards the distant mines of eastern Siberia, where death awaits the exile. Certain creeping death, a lingering torture, that sometimes lasts three entire years. End of chapter 7《チャプター8 of the Candlesticks by Emma Orksey。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain。Whoever has travelled in a first-class carriage of an Austrian state railway has learnt to know the acme of comfort and luxury that can be conveyed on wheels. True that whilst the traveller gains in the matter of softly cushioned seats, he loses in that of speed, but what would you? This is Eastern Europe, and the Oriental looks upon hurry as one of the seven deadly sins. So the railways he constructs never exceed forty miles an hour, but the springs of the carriages are balanced to a nicety and everything is done to render the passenger's prolonged stay in the coupé a pleasant and luxurious one. But, oh, there is one great, one very great drawback to travelling in those eastern countries. Who has not known the annoyance, the worry, the bustle attendant on the necessary custom-house examinations at the frontier? Both at Passau, at one end of the empire, and at Oderberg on the other, 
the weary traveller is usually landed an hour or so before sunrise. The imperious rules of the Austrian Custom House demand that every article of luggage pass under the inspection of its officials, and that under no circumstances a passenger be allowed to remain in his or her carriage, probably lest he or she may thereby succeed in keeping concealed the very articles of contraband most strictly taxed by the Austrian government. "'I don't think we need get out, Rosa,' said Madame Demidoff, in a sleepy voice from the corner of her coupé, as the express drew up at Oderberg, the frontier station. "'You saw the luggage registered through to Petersburg and loaded, did you not?' "'Oui, madame,' replied the maid, looking out of the carriage window. "'They are opening all the doors and making everybody get out. But they did tell me in Vienna that, if we have the luggage registered, it can go through without examination.' "'Anyway, I shall not get out. Put my valise and dressing bag close to me, and go and order two cups of coffee at the buffet, to be brought here.' "'I think Madame will not be disturbed,' said the maid, as she opened the carriage. "'Everyone has left the platform. I see no more officials about. I hope Madame will be all right whilst I am gone. I will be back directly.' And Rosa prepared to get out of the coupé. "'Excuse me, Mademoiselle,' said a voice, as she alighted on the platform. "'Everyone must get out here.' A man in the uniform of the custom-house officials stood by the carriage door, respectfully lifting his cap, as he peered into the coupé and saw Madame Demidoff surrounded by her luggage. "'Surely it is not necessary,' said Madame, in a tone of annoyance. "'My luggage is registered through, and they told me distinctly in Vienna that I shall not be troubled with these stupid formalities.' "'I am very sorry, Madame, but our orders are very strict, and we are not allowed to let anyone remain in the carriages, nor any luggage.' he added emphatically, pointing to the valise, dressing-bags, and rugs that lay on the cushioned seats. Madame Demidoff knew enough about officialdom to be well aware that it was absolutely useless to disobey or even to protest. The man was perfectly civil, nay, respectful, but at any sign of resistance he would call for help, and deposit Madame's luggage without hesitation on the platform, or carry it away to the customs hall, where she would perforce have to follow it. Resigning herself with an impatient sigh, she prepared to step out of the carriage, leaving Rosa and the man to follow with her things. She knew she had nothing that she need mind being handled by the most prying Austrian official. Her reports and papers this time were safe in the secret receptacles of the Empress candlesticks. These she had placed in her valise, labelling them conspicuously, China, fragile, the property of His Eminence Cardinal d'Orsay. The parcel might be opened, with a view to verifying the truth of the label but no one could guess that a Russian agent's reports were hidden inside such brittle works of art. The whole thing was merely a matter of annoyance and weariness, and Madame Demidoff soon found her way to the customs hall, followed by her maid and the polite but tiresome official, who were carrying her things. Her large trunks were lying in the hall. These, having been registered, were not opened, but marked with the Austrian Custom House stamp, as allowed to pass the frontier unmolested. "'Have you any bags or small luggage besides, madame?' asked an officer, who had been turning over Rosa's bag and undoing the bundle of rugs and umbrellas she had placed on the counter. "'Yes, I have a valise and dressing-bag. Rosa,' she said, "'open them. Here are the keys.' "'I was not carrying Madame's valise or her dressing-bag,' said the maid. "'The customs officer were carrying them. I don't see the things just at this moment. He must have put them down somewhere.' "'Find them at once. You had no right to let anyone touch them. You know I never allow anyone to carry my bag but yourself.' Madame Demidoff found it difficult to control her agitation, and Rosa peered anxiously round, trying to recognise the official who had charge of the precious bags. "'Did you say a customs official was carrying the things?' asked the porter, seeing the girl's distress. "'It is such an unlikely thing for any of them to do. They're all too busy in here.' "'He is not here at this moment,' said Rosa. "'It was a young man with a long brown beard and curly hair. He was in uniform.' "'Every one of the officials connected with the Custom House is in the room at this moment, miss. I have known them all for years. Not one is missing. I am beginning to be afraid you have been tricked by one of these clever robbers, who have done a deal of mischief before now at these custom stations. You see, it is so easy to rob people here, especially ladies, as—' "'Rosa!' gasped Madame Demidoff, who had overheard the man's last words, and now felt sick with terror. "'Look again. You must have been mistaken. Where is my valise?' "'You are responsible for my valise. I, I shall accuse you of theft unless you find my valise. I shall—' She checked herself just in time, for an amused and interested crowd of spectators began to assemble around her and her maid, eager to watch this elegantly dressed lady so completely losing her self-control over the loss of some small articles of luggage. The second bell had already sounded. The passengers were preparing to resume their seats in the express. 
Madame Demidoff, seeing the piercing eyes of one or two officials fixed searchingly at her, felt the necessity of pulling herself together. Her long knowledge of the world, the official world, told her of the danger of betraying too much emotion over apparent trifles, lest those trifles became thereby an object of suspicion. Regaining her sang-froid, she returned to the porters, who stood gaping round, and said with calmness, "'My valise and dressing-bag contain some very valuable jewellery. I will give a thousand guldens for their recovery, two thousand if I have them back before dawn. In the meanwhile, one of you take my luggage to a cab, and I shall be glad to know the name of the best hotel in this town where I shall stay until my property is recovered. I must interview the police at once. That is, I suppose, as early in the morning as possible.' Rosa, she added, turning to her poor discomfited maid, while her orders were being promptly and noiselessly carried out, here are a month's wages, and the money to pay your fare back to Vienna. Do not ever let me set eyes on you again. After that she walked gracefully and steadily across the room, got into a cab, and was driven to the hotel, while poor Rosa was left to be consoled by the kind porter, until the next train started back for Vienna. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of the Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In the meanwhile, Ivan Volansky had suffered terribly. He was in a peculiar position at that moment. Anxious as he had been to serve the great cause, he had imperilled it unwittingly, almost beyond recall. His comrades had trustingly placed their lives, their freedom, in his hands, lured by his promises of immunity, and twenty-four hours later, he had placed them all in the hands of an agent of that very police they so justly dreaded. And yet the nuncio, in the morning following that eventful night, had succeeded in somewhat reassuring him. Perhaps his eminence felt a trifle guilty in the matter of those candlesticks, and thought his secretary was blaming him for allowing them to pass out of his hands. He took great care to explain to Ivan the accident to one of Cupid's arms, which both he and Madame Demidoff had noticed, and which finally decided him to accept her kind offer. Little by little, Volensky gleaned from the Cardinal a minute account of all that passed between him and the fair Russian, on the subject of the Emperor's candlesticks. He heard that Madame had, with her own hands, packed the damaged bibelot, and placed it on one side, and had herself professed to take the utmost care that not the slightest accident should happen further. Here was a reason, clearly, for once more thanking Providence, that it should have guided his hand towards the damaged candlestick when secreting the fateful papers. Madame Demidoff so far knew nothing, that was a reasonable hope, and as soon as his eminence had left Vienna, which unfortunately would not be till the evening, Ivan meant to travel to Petersburg without delay, and on behalf of his absent master, ask Madame Demidoff to remit the candlesticks to him, for safe custody within the walls of the papal legation. In the meanwhile, not a word to his comrades. He had seen the President the evening before, and told him of the alteration in the Cardinal's plan, which would enable him, Volensky, to deliver the papers in Taranyev's hands two days before the anticipated time. To tell them all of the dangers they were in would be unnecessary cruelty. What could they do but wait for the blow, if it was destined to fall? Merkovich would wish to kill the Tsarevich. It would be revolting to murder a defenceless prisoner. Now his eminence had quieted his anxieties. There was no fear, no hurry. After the cardinal left, Volensky's peace of mind enabled him to sleep quietly, without harassing dreams of prisons and Siberia. He felt alert and well the next morning, ready to take the express through Oderberg to Petersburg, little more than twenty-four hours after Madame Demidoff, following closely on her footsteps. He breakfasted cheerfully, as one free from care, and with mechanical hands opened the morning paper to glance at the news and when he read it, there was that in the paper that crushed all his hopes, and for the first time led him to doubt that it was Providence who watched over the socialist cause. Another daring robbery on the frontier. Yesterday, during the examination of passengers' luggage at Oderberg, at six o'clock in the morning, a daring robbery was committed. As Madame Demidoff, a lady well known in our aristocratic circles, was alighting from her coupé, a man, disguised in the uniform of our customs officials, offered to carry her dressing-bag and valise. He appeared to be following her with her belongings, and it was not till nearly a quarter of an hour later that Madame Demidoff realised that the man and all her belongings had disappeared. It is stated by the lady herself that the valise contained some valuable articles. 
her extraordinary agitation on hearing of her loss was much commented upon. The matter is in the hands of the police, who already have an important clue. What this announcement in the paper meant to Volensky, the reader will easily imagine. After the comparative peace and security of the last few hours, the blow seemed to fall on him with an almost stunning vigour. The paper fell from his hand, and for fully ten minutes he sat there staring into vacancy, unable to think, to plan, his brain almost refusing to take in the fact and all the terrors it conveyed. But a few hours ago those papers, which he had with so light a heart confided to what he felt sure was the safest hiding-place he could devise, had, by some mysterious help of providence, escaped the eyes of the most astute woman in Russia. Unknown to herself, she was carrying the secrets of a band of young nihilists safely across the Russian frontier in the teeth of the police, she, an agent, a spy herself. The situation was hazardous. Volensky had trembled that some remote chance might at the eleventh hour play him false, but the chance was so slight a one that he had even the heart to laugh inwardly at the curious coincidence that caused the police agent to be the means of conveying nihilistic papers across the border. Moreover, in two days at most, he would once more have regained the papers, hand them over to his comrades, and when all was safe again, laugh at his own terrors. But now how terribly was the situation altered! The fateful papers at this moment were at the mercy of thieves or receivers of stolen goods, who were sure to make the most profitable use of their find for the secret of the candlesticks could not remain one for long, once they fell into the hand of bric-a-brac dealers so expert in these matters. And Ivan shuddered as he thought how completely in the power of scoundrels he and his comrades would presently be. Would the papers be used for blackmailing, denunciation, or what? The valet had come in some little while ago to warn the secretary that it was fully time to start, if he wished to catch the Casa Odeberg Express, but Ivan had impatiently said that his plans were changed, he was not starting that morning. When the man had left him, and he was once more alone, he again took up the Fremdenblatt, and read the fateful article through and through, till his aching temples began to throb, and the letters dance before his burning eyes, till he felt dizzy and faint with that most awful terror, the terror of the unknown. The police have an important clue, he muttered. What clue? And what would happen if they did discover the stolen goods? The valise, of course, would be opened, and all the articles identified and handed back to Madame Demidoff who would, after that, probably only be too glad to give the candlesticks back to Volensky and shift all further responsibilities from her shoulders. But in the meanwhile, they would be handled by dozens of pairs of hands, the thieves first, then the police, then the officials, any one of whom might chance upon the secret spring, and then... Volensky tried to persuade himself that this chance was very remote. The secret receptacles very ingeniously hidden, the springs very stiff, and only liable to yield after a great deal of pressure. But still a restlessness now seized him. He felt unable to sit still. The crowded streets seemed to lure him, and vaguely he had a hope that from the groups at the cafés he might hear fresh news, new developments of this robbery, that were sure to set all tongues wagging and discussing. He took his hat and made his way down the collivatering towards the opera house. Instinct, the instinct of self-preservation, whispered to him to control himself, not to let any passing stranger notice his curious agitation his wild, haggard look. He sauntered into one of the larger cafés, exchanging handshakes and greetings here and there. It seemed strange that not one of those he met referred to the robbery at Oderberg. Volensky could not understand that an event of such immense magnitude to himself should seem one of such utter indifference to others. The new opera, the expected cabinet crisis, Galmea's latest success, were all discussed around and with him, but no one seemed to think the theft of Madame Demidoff's valise of the slightest importance, and Volensky dared not bring the subject up himself. He feared lest his voice would tremble, his anxious eyes betray his agitation. Hungrily he listened for news, for comments, and went from one café to another, but only once did he hear an illusion made to the robbery. One young fellow said to another that no doubt Madame Demidoff had already succeeded in putting the police on the track of the thieves. She was so expert in police matters herself. The other young man laughed, and the subject was dropped. The hours passed slowly on. The enforced inactivity weighed heavily on Belensky's mind. The strain of weary waiting for some unknown catastrophe that might be close at hand was beginning to tell on him, and he left the busy streets of the city for some more remote, less frequented spots, where he might allow himself a little more freedom, his agitation a little more scope. Thus his wanderings had led him towards the publishing offices of the Fremdenblatt, outside which a great amount of bustle and noise proclaimed the sending out of the first afternoon edition. 
inwardly thanking the chance that had led his footsteps in this direction, Belensky purchased a copy of the paper and eagerly scanned its contents. Ah, there it was, some news evidently. The robbery at Oderberg. Our frontier police have once more displayed the wonderful insight and promptness of action for which they are justly noted. The actual thief who stole the dressing-bag and police of Madame Demidoff at Oderberg yesterday morning was arrested in a private room of the Heinrich Marshall public house in that same town where he had taken refuge with his accomplice in order to divide the booty. As the police forced their way into the room, the two thieves were apparently quarrelling loudly over some of the trinkets, which were scattered all over the place. The man, a notorious character, who had long been wanted by the police, seemed in too high a passion, or else too scared, to attempt to flee, but his accomplice, who, by the way, is a woman, succeeded in gathering a few articles together and effecting an escape through the window. She was, however, recognised by one of the police, and no doubt by now is also under arrest. The police were greatly aided in their discovery by two or three of the porters at the station, who, it is said, were stimulated by the large sum of money offered by Madame Demidoff as a reward. Great, therefore, was the dissatisfaction and indignation amongst them when the lady, under the pretense that one or two valuable articles were missing, refused to give any reward till those articles were found. She appeared much agitated on giving her evidence before the magistrate, and explained this agitation on the grounds that one of the missing articles was a pair of very valuable antique gold and china candlesticks, which were not her property, but which were entrusted to her special care by a friend, whose name she refused to disclose. The lady's singular excitement throughout the hearing of the case is causing much comment. The paper dropped from Belensky's hand, and he stood in the street staring into vacancy, almost staggering as though he were intoxicated. The terrible thing about this whole drama that was being enacted around him was the fact that, though he was the person most concerned in its developments, it was absolutely futile, nay dangerous, for him to take the slightest part in it. And not the least of his sufferings was this feeling of utter powerlessness to do aught that could tend to save his comrades and himself from the terrible crushing blow that might at any moment annihilate them all. But the time for serious deliberation had now arrived. It became absolutely imperative, Ivan felt this, that he should trace himself a line of conduct, adopt some plan, decide how far he would warn his comrades, and perhaps seek their help and advice. But for this quiet was needed, and Volensky now retraced his steps towards his hotel, feeling, moreover, that he had no right to neglect his eminence's business and correspondence, as, alas, he had but too long done. On his way home, many a conflicting thought chased another, many a surmise, a problem, the solution of which might mean life or death to his friends and himself. Having locked the door of his study, Ivan set himself resolutely to the task of chasing away all thoughts of his worries, and devoting himself to his master's work. He wrote what letters were necessary, sorted those that would require to be forwarded to his eminence, arranged the papers that related to work done, and it was not till late in the afternoon, when the valet brought him a light, that he allowed himself the leisure of once more reverting to the all-engrossing subject of the missing papers, and gave himself the time for thinking over his plans. The strict adherence to his duties had done him good, both mentally and physically. His brain seemed more clear, his nerves less on the quiver, than during those hours he had spent wandering idly and restlessly in the streets. Clearly the situation at this moment was no worse than it had been in the morning and there was, as yet, no occasion to alarm his fellow-conspirators by telling them the facts of the case, and turning their wrath upon himself, who already had so much to bear. No, it was better they should remain in ignorance for a little longer, for Ivan had not abandoned the hope that the papers were still undiscovered, and that he could, after the terrible fright she had had, induce Madame Demidoff to give the candlesticks back to him as soon as she had recovered them from the police. The danger, the sole danger throughout, lay in the fact that papers so terribly compromising should be, if only for a short time, so hopelessly out of his reach, that so deadly a secret should lie at the mercy of so mere a chance. As for his eminence, Belensky well knew that, as soon as he was free from diplomatic duties, he never even glanced at a newspaper. His name, so far, had not been mentioned, and— But here a fresh, a curious train of thought arose in Ivan's mind, and the darker side of the picture— he had vainly tried to look upon as bright, presented itself before his mind. Why had the cardinal's name been so studiously kept back by Madame Demidoff? Was it merely that, very naturally, she did not wish him to know how badly she had failed in her trust? Or was there... 
and Ivan paled at the thought, some reason for her wishing that his eminence should not hear of her loss, some reason for the curious excitement into which, woman of the world as she was, she had betrayed herself, to the extent of arousing the comments of the magistrates and the reporters. Had she perchance already discovered the dreaded secret, and wishing to claim the honour and glory of her find, was she anxious to recover the papers, and, with them in her hands, denounce the conspirators and claim her reward? Was her agitation the outcome of her terror, lest she should lose the precious proofs, without which, perhaps, her memory might be at fault in naming the perpetrators of the daring plot? Ay, all that was possible. Ivan knew it all the time, strive though he might to lure himself into the false belief that all was sure to be quite safe so far. Madame Demidoff was evidently staying at Oderberg, ready to claim her property at once. Ivan pondered if he should communicate with her, a sensible proceeding enough, if she had not discovered the papers, but worse than useless if she had already done so. One more chance now lay open to Ivan, and that was to approach the police himself, now that the candlesticks had actually been mentioned as part of the missing property, and find out if they would allow him to claim them on behalf of his eminence, the papal nuncio. With that object in view, late as it was, he ordered a faker, and drove off to the headquarters of the detective department. The chief of the police, Baron de Hermenstal, he knew quite well, having frequently met him in society, while in attendance on Cardinal d'Orsay. The Baron was a busy man, very busy, and he kept Volensky waiting three-quarters of an hour in his ante-room. Ivan had plenty of leisure, therefore, to decide what line of diplomacy it were best to adopt. He would tell Baron de Hermenstal, under an official seal of secrecy, that the candlesticks alluded to by Madame Demidoff, in her account of her missing property, were none other than those entrusted to her by his master, Cardinal d'Orsay, that these antique candlesticks were to be unofficially presented to a lady resident in Petersburg, by the papal nuncio, on behalf of an exalted personage whom Volensky would not name, but would leave Baron de Hermenstahl to guess. Finally, he would add that his eminence completely relied on Baron de Hermenstahl's well-known tact and discretion, and that both the cardinal and the exalted personage would desire that the matter be kept as far as possible from further publicity, the candlesticks not pass through any hands that were not absolutely necessary, and that it was to further this object that Volensky, on behalf of his eminence, now claimed Baron de Hermenstahl's powerful assistance. This plan and speech well formed in his head, Ivan, feeling more calm, was able to enter the private room of the chief of the Austrian police, even without a tremor. Baron de Hermenstahl, a quiet, aristocratic-looking old man, with a charming eighteenth-century manner, listened attentively to all Volensky had to say, asked him to take a seat while he would look over his notes relating to the case, and after a few moments, "'My dear Volensky,' he said, "'I should be very happy under the circumstances to help His Eminence in any way that is within my power. If you will tell me what you would wish me to do, I might see in what way I can be of most assistance to you.' I merely want your permission to claim the candlesticks on behalf of His Eminence, without their passing through any hands save yours and mine, and without all the formalities that usually attend the claiming of property found by the police. But Madame Demidoff is, for the time being, the person from whom the candlesticks have been robbed. She might object to their being handed over to any one save herself. Madame Demidoff has declared before the magistrate that they are not her property, replied Valensky. I will communicate with her as soon as I have your authorization to do so, and you will find that she will be only too glad to hand over to me all responsibility in the matter. That will be for her to decide, rejoined the chief of police dryly. We can discuss the matter later on. Anyhow, I can promise you that I will communicate with you the moment the police have seized the missing articles. They have not yet been found, then? asked Ivan breathlessly. They are not actually in our possession, corrected the chief of police. "'May I ask what that implies?' asked Volensky, whose parched lips and quivering nerves hardly enabled him to frame an intelligible query. "'It implies that we know where they are, and that we can lay our hands on them at any moment. "'And stay, let me explain,' added the polite Baron kindly, as he noted Volensky's eagerness. "'The police are, as you know, well acquainted with the woman who was in the room with the thief at the time of the arrest.' and who ran away through the window with part of the booty. She is one of that class whom it is a bon ton to designate as the unfortunate. Yes, I knew that the female thief had escaped, but I should have thought that our police, usually so active, when there is little rough-and-tumble work to do, 
would not fail in overtaking and capturing her. That would have been done, no doubt, but for a very important reason, which is this. The officer in command, once having recognized the woman, knew that he could lay hands on her at any moment. She lives in Vienna, and haunts every cabaret and third-rate hotel, her favorite resort being the Kaiser Franz. He therefore intends to lull her into a false security, with a view, by keeping a constant watch on her movements, of discovering and bringing to justice a gang of receivers of stolen goods, who so far have completely baffled our vigilance, and whose tool we believe her to be. You think, then, that the woman brought those candlesticks to Vienna with her? We know she did, for she was seen in Vienna this very morning, and is being closely watched. Surely Your Excellency will give immediate orders to have her room searched this very evening, said Ivan imploringly. I have no objection to doing that, said Baron de Hermannstahl urbanely, as I am anxious to prove to His Eminence how willing I am to serve him. Your Excellency will allow me to accompany the police, asked Valensky eagerly, to identify the candlesticks, he added, seeing that Baron de Hermannstahl shook his head in emphatic refusal. There may be others there. On one condition, then, that you do not interfere with our men in the discharge of their duty, merely pointing out the articles you claim as your property, and that you allow the officer on duty to bring them here to my office without opposition. To your office, said Ivan. Yes, I shall have to insist that the candlesticks remain in my charge until I hear definitely from you or Madame Demidoff herself that she wishes them to be handed over to you. And in the meanwhile... I promise you faithfully that no one shall even touch them. You shall yourself see the parcel locked in my desk, and I shall be delighted to give them up to you as soon as I am satisfied that Madame Demidoff has no objection to my doing so. Ivan reflected a moment. In his mind there at once arose the idea that chance would certainly favour him once he actually had the candlesticks in his hands. He had but to press the spring while the police were searching another part of the room, and he could, he felt sure, extract the papers unperceived. There were so many eventualities that might happen, between the time when the candlesticks were found, and the moment when Baron de Hermannstahl would finally turn the key of his desk on them. So many opportunities, any one of which would find him on the alert. His hesitation, therefore, lasted but a moment. The next, he had assured the amiable Baron that he would strictly adhere to his instructions, and was quite willing to wait for Madame Demidoff's decision, once his fears that the candlesticks might be too much tampered with had been allayed. In the name of his eminence, he added diplomatically, I thank your excellency for your courtesy in the matter. Pray say no more, replied Baron de Hermannstahl, as he touched the bell, in order to give the necessary instructions. Tell Sergeant Mayor I wish to speak to him, he said to his valet. It is very late, he added, looking at his watch. Nearly eight o'clock, but that is no matter, as no doubt you will find the woman has gone out on her nightly errands and left you the coast clear. A discreet rap at the door and the sergeant appeared, saluting his chief. "'Mayor,' said His Excellency, "'do I understand that the woman Greta Ortlinger has so far not been caught trying to sell the stolen property?' "'No, Your Excellency. She has not left her room since this morning, when she arrived from Oderberg. Two of my men have been stationed outside her doors all day, and she has not gone out. Her concierge thinks she has been in bed all day. She drove this morning direct from the station to her room.' and had then a large-sized box with her. Very good. I wish you now to take one other man with you, and go to the woman's room with this warrant to search all her premises. You will seize all the suspicious property you can find. If the woman is there, you may arrest her. If not, your men will be having an eye on her, and she can be arrested when she comes home. Monsieur here has my permission to accompany you, and to identify certain articles that belong to him and which you must bring back here to my office. Do you understand? Yes, Your Excellency. Au revoir, then, my dear Walensky, said Baron de Hermannstahl, turning to Ivan. I shall expect you here with the candlesticks, according to your promise, on which I rely. And His Excellency, rising from his seat and dismissing the sergeant with a nod, thereby intimated to Walensky that he had done all his duty allowed him to do, and that the audience was at an end. Ivan once more was profuse in his thanks. Fate indeed favoured him. It was now for him to seize the splendid opportunity, with skill and promptitude. He felt in his pocket-book that he was well provided with money, a douceur to the sergeant, should he chance to see what Valensky did not intend, might be necessary. Five minutes afterwards he was in a faker with Sergeant Mayer and another member of the corps, 
and in his heart of hearts he hoped that the next half-hour would see his precious papers transferred once more to the inner pocket of his coat. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was in a narrow street in one of the most squalid quarters of Vienna that the Fieker stopped, after some ten minutes' rattle over the cobbled streets of the city. Sergeant Mayer jumped out, followed by Ivan and the other police officer, and casting a quick searching glance along the apparently deserted street, he walked unhesitatingly under one of the wide porticoes in front of him. The house was one of a row of tall buildings, ugly, square, and straight, with a balcony running along outside the first-floor fronts the whole length of the street, and a wide, open porte cochere leading through a square courtyard to the lodgings at the back of the buildings. There was a lodge for the concierge on the right, at the foot of the wide stone staircase that leads up to the front of the house, but no one guarded the apartments that overlooked the courtyard. There was nothing there worth guarding the inhabitants belonging mostly to the very poorest classes of Vienna, who had nothing worth stealing. A group of women, with untidy hair and dirty aprons, stopped their chatter and nudged each other significantly, with great coarse bare elbows, as they caught sight of the police uniform, and one or two heads appeared at some of the windows, as the heavy steps of Sergeant Mayer and his followers echoed on the stone pavement of the courtyard. Having reached the dark and narrow staircase leading to the floors above, Sergeant Mayer turned to Ivan. I do not see either of our fellows anywhere about, so I conclude the woman has gone out. So much the better, said Volensky. We need have no disturbance, then. I suppose the people of the house are used to this sort of thing, for they took very little heed of your uniform or our presence. The sergeant shrugged his shoulders, intimating that he cared little for any disturbance that might arise, and he added, This house is one of the worst famed in this part of Vienna. It is almost entirely tenanted by women of greater Ottlinger's class. A police inspection of their premises is a very frequent occurrence, and the inhabitants have, I think, one and all, spent some time in prison or hospital. The three men now began cautiously ascending the dark stone stairs, guiding themselves by the narrow iron handrail, and feeling their way with utmost care. Sergeant Mayer, who was in front, seemed to be very sure of where he was going, for it was without any hesitation that he stopped somewhere about the fifth floor, and, crossing a dark passage, tried the handle of one of the doors that opened thereon. The door, however, seemed to be locked, and after one or two repeated loud knocks, the sergeant applied his broad shoulders to the feebly resisting timber, and broke it open without any difficulty. The room in which the three men now found themselves was but dimly illumined by a glimmer of light that came in through the window from the courtyard below. The sergeant struck a match and lighted his lantern. The aspect of that room then presented itself in all its squalor and hideousness. An iron bedstead, covered with a ragged coloured counterpane, stood out from the centre of the wall opposite. To the right, as they entered, an earthenware stove, with the tiles mostly cracked and loose, then a coarsely painted chest, the drawers of which were mostly open, displaying a medley of dirty laces and faded ribbons, two or three chairs in a rickety condition, propped against the walls, and a table with a broken ewer and cracked basin, completed the furniture of this abode of misery and degradation. The floor was bare, the boards unwashed and rough. On the window-sill stood a mirror, and two or three pots of powder and cosmetics, while on the chest of drawers lay a litter of papers, and two or three faded photographs. Ivan stood gazing round in horror. It had never been his misfortune to witness this type of misery, sordid and abject, that was depicted by this bare room, by the tawdry scraps of ribbon, the half-empty, evil-smelling pots of cosmetics, and his mind reverted to the exalted notion he and his comrades had of the people, of the poor, who were in the future to frame laws and rule empires, the people, about whom they talked so much, and knew so little, the people whose men and women lived like this. Then, pulling himself together, he gazed blankly around him. Save for that chest of drawers which appeared half empty, he could see nothing wherein the Emperor's candlesticks could have been hidden, and a cold perspiration stood on his forehead, as he turned to Mayer and asked him what course he intended to pursue. The sergeant once more shrugged his shoulders, then pointing to the bed he ordered his man to turn the palliasse over. "'Would you like to search that chest of drawers?' he smiled, sarcastically addressing Belensky. "'My impression is that the bird has flown and taken her treasures with her.' Ivan waited not for a second offer. He was already emptying the drawers, throwing ribbons and rags in a confused heap on the floor. Hope was fast dwindling away. 
this golden opportunity, from which he had expected so much, was proving futile. The splendid chance he would have had in this dark room, if only the candlesticks were to fall in his hands, was not to be his after all. Half fainting with the closeness of the atmosphere, and the nerve strain consequent on the bitter disappointment he was experiencing, Ivan dared not let the sergeant see his face, frightened lest the astute detective should notice his strange agitation, and jump at conclusions which he might afterwards communicate to his chief. "'It seems to me,' said Mayer at last, "'that we are wasting our time here. The woman has evidently taken with her what valuables she has stolen, either because she is always prepared for a police raid during her absence, or she may actually have gone to dispose of them. Anyhow, monsieur,' he added, "'with your permission we will leave this matter for the present, and report proceedings to the chief.' Ivan had completely emptied the drawers, and was now impatiently turning over the letters and papers that were lying in a confused heap on the top of the chest. A half-torn, almost wholly faded photograph had riveted his attention. A somewhat coarse, large-featured woman's face, with dark, provoking eyes, and a wide, laughing mouth. He wondered, as he looked at it, whether this was the woman who held his fate and that of his comrades in one of those clumsy, low-bred hands and whether he would ask Sergeant Mayer if this was Greta Ottlinger. "'Is this the woman?' he asked at last, with a sudden determination, turning towards the police officer and holding out the photograph. "'Yes, it is,' replied Mayer, after a hasty glance. "'No beauty, is she?' he added with a laugh. Then, the other man having opened the door, the sergeant stood, evidently impatient to be gone, his lantern in his hand dimly lighting the dark passage beyond. Volensky, with a sudden impulse, slipped the photograph into his pocket and throwing a last hopeless look at the squalid abode he had entered, so full of hope, followed Mayer down the narrow stairs. He was loath to give up all hope. His was a sanguine and buoyant disposition that refused to give way to despair. A plan had already formed in his brain, a confused idea that would require the quietness of the deserted streets to order and to organise. "'As we have not found anything belonging to me up there,' he said to Sergeant Mayer, as the latter prepared to step into the cab that was waiting for them outside, "'I don't think there is any necessity for me to follow you to His Excellency's office. What do you think?' "'You know best, monsieur, of course,' replied Mayer. "'I have a very short report to make about the woman's absence, together with every article of stolen property. Also the fact that our two fellows are no doubt on her track, as I do not see them anywhere about. His Excellency must then decide if it is worth while going to the Kaiser Franz tonight, on the chance of finding her there, or leave the matter alone till her return.' "'I should think the latter is by far the wisest course,' said Ivan hastily. "'However, that is none of my business. "'Will you tell His Excellency that, as my property has not been found, "'I will call on him again to-morrow morning, "'and in the meanwhile will communicate with Madame Demidoff?' "'Sergeant Mayor and his assistant bowed to Ivan as they stepped into the fiacre. "'Bolensky waited a few moments till the sound of the wheels died out in the distance. "'Then, taking a cigarette from his case, he lighted it with great deliberation, and sauntered off towards the Ringstrasse, with an anxious but determined look on his young face. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of The Emperor's Candlesticks by Emma Auxey This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Poor Valensky had begun to look very haggard and careworn. The mental strain of the past few days was beginning to tell upon him. He was paying less attention to his dress. There was an absence of elasticity in his step, and an almost furtive look in his usually so frank, if dreamy, eyes. He realised this, as, having reached the brilliantly lighted cafés that enlivened both sides of the open and colvatering, he caught sight of his own figure in one of the tall pier-glasses beyond the windows of the shops, and noticed the untidy look of his cravat, the dusty appearance of his clothes. He looked at his watch. It was barely nine o'clock time enough to pay a flying visit to his hotel, and remedy the obvious defects of his toilet, before he sallied forth to accomplish the task he had in a moment's resolution set himself to do. It was with the greatest care that he proceeded to change his clothes for the conventional black and white of evening attire, not forgetting the bouquet in his buttonhole, nor the fine handkerchief peeping from the pocket of the coat. He wished to look the perfect type of the young man about town, idle, elegant, and gay, a role he had played so much during the greater part of his life that it had become second nature, and especially he wished to leave absolutely behind him all traces of the harassed conspirator, who feels himself tracked and dreads at every turn to meet his doom. There was no doubt that since the fatal moment when the candlesticks were stolen on the Austrian frontier, fate loomed dark against him and his friends, 
and he had been alone to face the dangers and difficulties to battle against relentless chance. The most adverse coincidences had surrounded him from the first, and when luck appeared to be on the turn, some untoward, wholly unforeseen event occurred to dash any hope he may have had to the ground. First the Cardinal's unfortunate idea of entrusting Madame Demidoff with the candlesticks, then the robbery at Odeberg, next the escape of one of the thieves with the very articles that were of such paramount importance, finally the one grand opportunity he would have had to-night, but for Greta Ottlinger's wonderful look, or foresight, in taking the booty along with her. But from all this chaos of mischance the unfortunate young man had gleaned one fresh ray of hope. He hardly dared to trust it, but it gave him the inestimable boon of being able to act for himself, to be actually employed in trying to rescue himself and his friends from the terrible position into which his well-meant blunder had led them. It meant that with tact and diplomacy all was not lost yet, and that in the meanwhile he would at least be free from the intolerable torture of inactivity, waiting, wearily waiting, for that crushing blow that might descend at any moment. As it was getting late, and Vienna was in the full swing of its usual evening entertainments, Bolensky found his way to the Kaiser Franz, a brilliantly lighted but tumble-down looking hotel in the Museumgasse, which had been named to him by the police as the usual nightly haunt of Greta Ottlinger. Everyone who has been to Vienna probably has noticed this hotel, with its flashy front, decorated with masses of gilded plaster, broken and tarnished, and its showy-looking porters in threadbare knee-breeches that show signs of once having been of crimson plush, and gold-laced coats that but too plainly proclaim the second-hand wardrobe dealer's shop. It is mostly very noisy from within, especially in the small hours of the morning. Under the portico, which is always very brilliantly lighted, usually stand half a dozen of so very young dandies about town, with their opera hats worn at the backs of their heads, and a full-flavoured cigar between their teeth, more with a view to giving them an air of maturity than for actual enjoyment. They scan the overdressed, overpainted, mostly somewhat faded beauties that pass up and down the street in front of them, waiting for an invitation for supper and champagne, and do so with an air of nonchalance that would fain betray the habits of a roué. It was with this crowd of young men that Volensky mixed, though he had the greatest horror usually both for the scanners and the scanned, but to-night he stood under the gaudy portico watching the very unattractive bevy of yellow-haired beauties that passed in front of him, as if he expected to find the idol of his heart among that crew. He had taken the precaution to inquire of one of the porters if Greta Ottlinger had gone within, and being answered in the negative, he also cocked his hat at the back of his head and proceeded to light a cigar, trying to look as unconcerned as he could, while he waited for her, the original of the photograph he had so providentially found in that uninviting garret, her, whose confidence at that moment he would have purchased with her weight in gold. Would champagne or unlimited cognac loosen her tongue, he wondered? Still they passed. Some of them were accosted and taken into supper, others tried by a smile to encourage the diffident. They all looked very much alike, Volensky thought. They might all be sisters, in fact, as they were sisters in shame and misery. But her he would recognise. He knew it. He would know her among a thousand. He had only looked at her photograph one minute, but her face danced before his eyes, ugly, commonplace as it was. Was it not the face of his destiny? Ah! There she comes at last. Ivan seemed to feel her presence even before he actually heard her harsh, ill-bred voice, and recognised her coarse, low-cast features under the shadow of a cheap, gaudy hat. Even before he had time to speak to her, she was close up to him. No doubt she had noticed how intently he had been watching her. He threw away his cigar, and trying to look amiably at the poor wretch, he beckoned her to follow him. She surveyed him up and down, took in at a glance that the cloth of his coat was of the finest, his linen irreproachable, his cigar fragrant, this evidently leading her to the conclusion that there would be plenty of money spent on the supper. She nodded a careless adieu at her less fortunate companions, and followed Volensky into the hall. Ivan was at the bureau, ordering a private room, and the most recherche supper, and choicest champagne the Kaiser Franz could boast of. The waiters, obsequious and attentive, were addressing congratulatory nods to Greta at the little gold mine she had evidently come across, and very soon Volensky and his companion were ushered into a gaudy, showy apartment on the first floor. The window opened on to the museum gasser, and Volensky leaned out into the cold night air, trying to cool his throbbing temples and calm his quivering nerves. The presence of that common, showily-dressed woman made him feel uncomfortable. 
he could not chase from his mind the vision of that garret, up a squalid stair with its bare floor, rickety bed and drawers full of dirty, tawdry knick-knacks. He tried to think of her as the one being who could, if she would, if he set the right way to work, save him from his perilous position. She had evidently hidden the candlesticks, in some secure spot, away from the eyes of the police, or, maybe, had already sold them to an accomplice. To find this out was his self-imposed task, and the few moments that elapsed before the waiter returned with the supper Ivan spent in stealing himself to the ordeal. For a trying ordeal it would surely be to a young and refined man, unaccustomed to the coarser pleasures of the gay city. Ivan, in turning round, caught the woman's eyes fixed with an amused, half-pitying expression upon him. Clearly she thought him a young, shy fool, anxious to taste the cup of dissipation, but with a lingering awkwardness when brought face to face with it. The part suited Ivan. He determined to play it, and hide his nervous irritability under the cloak of intense shyness. He did not even know what type of conversation was expected of him, but he trusted that the champagne, which he had ordered dry and plentiful, would loosen his own tongue as well as hers. Greta had employed the last few moments in divesting herself of her cloak and hat, and she now appeared in a gaudy evening dress, displaying charms that, like the Emperor's candlesticks, had the value of antiquity. "'Leave everything on the sideboard,' she said to the waiter. "'We will wait on ourselves, and you need not come to ring you.' The waiter, well trained, arranged the supper-table as directed, then taking a last look round to see that everything was in order, he discreetly withdrew. "'I hope you will like what I have ordered,' said Ivan awkwardly. "'If not, please ask for anything you want, anything that will make you lively, you know,' he added, with a forced laugh. "'We must enjoy ourselves, Greta, mustn't we?' The ice was broken. Greta burst into a merry peal of laughter. "'Well, you are the funniest creature I have ever come across,' she said, shaking with merriment. "'Are you afraid of me? You have not opened your mouth since you brought me here. No, not there,' she said, as Ivan solemnly sat down opposite her at the table. "'I call that most unsociable. I give you my word, I won't eat you up. Ach, <laughs> yeah, she added with a sigh. "'The things on the table are much more appetizing than you, and you are not the first young gentleman I have supped with. Come and sit here, little booby.' and she placed her chair close to her own. Ivan, glad that she had started a conversation, which she was evidently well able to conduct by herself, changed his seat as she wished, and poured himself and her a full glass of champagne. Poor soul! She was enjoying the recherche supper thoroughly, and after the first glass of Perrier Jouet, began telling him anecdotes of her chequered career. A quarter of an hour later she sidled up to him, looking somewhat amused the while. "'You funny booby!' she laughed. "'You may, you know,' as she stretched out a very red cheek towards him. "'Look out! The waiter is coming,' said Ivan, pushing back his chair and hastily jumping up from the table. The bare idea of having to kiss that ugly, elderly woman sent a cold shiver down his spine. "'What if he is, booby-mine?' she replied, giving way to an uncontrollable fit of laughter. The idea seemed so amusing. "'Do you think he has never seen me kiss before? Come, cheer up. Sit down again. Your mammy shan't know. There now.' "'That is much more comfortable,' she added, for Belensky, on whom the importance of the present situation flashed again in an instant, had offered his feelings as a holocaust on the altar of the great cause, and resumed his seat beside the donna, with an arm around her antiquated waist. She placed her yellow head languishingly on his shoulder. "'Do you know, little booby, that, as a rule, I don't much care for young gentlemen like yourself?' "'No?' he asked indifferently. "'Well, you see—' she said with a pout. It is difficult to get any fun out of them. They are so mortally afraid of being seen in our company that they won't take us anywhere. Ivan could not help smiling to himself at the idea of taking this beauty, say, to the opera, and meeting his eminence on the way, and did not wonder that Greta was not very often taken to the theatre by young gentlemen like himself. Who are the people you like best, then, Greta? he asked, in order to keep up the conversation. "'Oh, I have many friends, real friends,' she said. "'But that's a fine ring you are wearing, booby.' Volensky felt at this moment that it was of the most vital importance that he should hear something of Greta's real friends. He must get her to tell him about them. Surely the accomplice, the one who was arrested at Oderberg, was one, and who knows, another might at this moment be actually in possession of the fateful candlesticks. Taking the ring off his finger, he slipped it into Greta's hand and said, with an effort at cordiality, "'Pray accept it. It will adorn your pretty hand. 
"'But do tell me some more about your friends, the real friends, that were not young gentlemen.' "'One of them was an actor, and earned quite a lot of money. He used to play all kinds of parts. And, Lord, sometimes now he makes me laugh with the clever way in which he can disguise his handsome features. Never mind, my pretty one,' she added coaxingly. "'You have got a nice little face of your own, too, and—' "'Never mind about my face. Tell me about his.' "'Now you're angry,' she said with a pout. "'I shan't talk any more about him, though he is a clever chap. I could tell you one or two of his tricks, but there, that's nothing to do with you.' Belensky felt the conversation was becoming interesting. He swallowed the last vestige of repulsion he felt for this coarse, now decidedly intoxicated woman, and, pouring her out a large tumbler full of a champagne, "'Drink this, my girl,' he said, "'and tell me some of your friend's tricks. I should like to hear something that'll make me laugh.' She drank the champagne and said nothing for a few moments, then burst into a loud laugh. "'Ha, ha, ha, ha! But I did the best trick of all today. I tricked them all, every one of them. They thought themselves mighty clever, they did. But Greta Ottlinger was one too many for them. Booby, don't look so scared. Give me another glass of champagne, and I'll tell you all about it. Another glass, Booby. Fill it to the top.' I don't often get champagne. Men mostly only give me beer or spirits. You see, I am not so young as I was. But champagne! I love champagne! She was getting very tipsy and very noisy. Valensky, no less excited than herself, tossed down a couple of glasses. He felt nothing. He was conscious of nothing, except that in five minutes he would know his fate, and that this woman held it in her hands. "'Oh, it was funny!' she laughed again. "'I knew they were after me. I am no fool. "'They let me come back to Vienna. "'They meant to search my rooms while I was out. "'They thought I wouldn't know.' "'Booby,' she whispered. "'Old Moses Grunbaum was waiting at the station for me. "'He had the things already in his shop, "'while the crew were following me round town "'and turning out my rooms, and they will find nothing. "'Ha, <laughs> ha, what a lark, Booby! "'Eh, Booby?' "'What's the matter with you? Here, I say, Booby, what on earth are you after?' For Valensky was fumbling for his hat, his gloves and his coat, and tossing a hundred guilders to the women. He had fled from the hotel, past the astonished waiters into the streets, leaving Greta to pay for the supper, and still muttering to herself, "'Booby, well, I never got in Himmel! Ach, yeah, yeah!' End of chapter 11